Saúde. Direito de todos e dever do Estado. Direito à moradia, ao emprego, à educação, a um meio ambiente saudável, à água potável, ao lazer, à cultura. Direito à voz e à paz. Respeito à diversidade. Saúde para a Fundação Oswaldo Cruz abriga todas essas dimensões. É assim desde 1900. Uma visão integrada da saúde. Na pesquisa, ensino, assistência, informação, comunicação, memória. Na promoção da saúde, na inovação. Onde permanentemente se pensam respostas para as necessidades da sociedade. Onde se faz ciência em defesa da vida. Você pode até não saber mas carrega a Fiocruz dentro de você. Desenvolvemos e fabricamos vacinas, medicamentos, biofármacos, testes para diagnóstico. Formamos pessoas do nível médio a pós-graduação. Realizamos pesquisas para superar ameaças à saúde, para diminuir riscos ambientais, para prevenir doenças e agravos. Pesquisas que beneficiam crianças, adultos, idosos. Uma instituição pública e estratégica de Estado, integrante do Sistema Único de Saúde, com uma rica história de contribuições à sociedade. Presente de ponta a ponta no Brasil, onde cada trabalhador é um elo forte e ativo. Nela, ciência e saúde cumprem uma função social para o país e o mundo. Pés fincados na tradição, olhos voltados para o futuro. Somos patrimônio da ciência e da saúde, da humanidade, do povo brasileiro. O Instituto Nacional de Controle de Qualidade em Saúde, INCQS, foi criado em 1981. É uma unidade técnico-científica da Fiocruz que atua em áreas de ensino, pesquisa e desenvolvimento de tecnologias de laboratório relativas ao controle da qualidade de insumos, produtos, ambientes e serviços. Parte integrante do SUS é elemento do Sistema Nacional de Vigilância Sanitária, atuando em estreita relação com a Agência Nacional do Setor, a Anvisa, laboratórios de saúde pública, vigilâncias sanitárias estaduais e municipais, entre outros entes. O INCQS é o único que realiza ensaios em lotes de sangue e hemoderivados utilizados no Brasil e é a instituição responsável pela análise laboratorial para a liberação de lotes de vacinas e de soros hiperimunes produzidos ou consumidos no país ou para exportação. O Instituto também avalia reagentes para diagnósticos, conjuntos, artigos e insumos para saúde e para diálise, medicamentos, cosméticos, saneantes e alimentos, por exemplo, detecção de níveis de agrotóxicos de drogas veterinárias e de transgênicos e analisa amostras relacionadas à saúde ambiental. Além da atividade laboratorial, o Instituto emite pareceres sobre questões técnico-científicas relativas à vigilância sanitária. O INCQS é acreditado pelo Inmetro em diversos ensaios laboratoriais e serviços de calibração, tendo um sistema de gestão da qualidade consolidado e eficiente. Inclusive, é pré-qualificado pela Organização Mundial de Saúde nas áreas de medicamentos e vacinas. Este é o Instituto Nacional de Controle de Qualidade em Saúde, na Fiocruz, contribuindo para fortalecer o SUS em benefício da população brasileira.
Instituto de Ciências Biomédicas da Universidade de São Paulo é uma referência nacional e internacional de qualidade no ensino, na pesquisa e nas atividades de cultura e extensão. Fundado em 1969, o ICB está localizado na cidade universitária, em São Paulo, com instalações em oito prédios. Possui ainda uma unidade na cidade de Montenegro, em Rondônia, e um posto avançado em Cruzeiro do Sul, no Acre. O ICB está estruturado em sete departamentos, anatomia, biologia celular e do desenvolvimento, farmacologia, fisiologia e biofísica, imunologia, microbiologia e parasitologia, os quais contemplam as principais áreas das ciências biomédicas. Nosso ambiente é multicultural e amplamente democrático. Aqui no ICB valorizamos a conduta ética, respeitamos a diversidade, incentivamos a consciência crítica e capacidade criativa dos nossos alunos, funcionários e professores. Em meio a esse universo multidisciplinar, o ICB completa seus 50 anos com uma excelência consolidada e busca formar cada vez mais profissionais que produzam conhecimento e inovação de modo a contribuir para o desenvolvimento da nossa sociedade. Seja você também parte do nosso Instituto. graduação, 400 estudantes de pós-graduação, 150 técnicos administrativos e 130 docentes. Juntos somos uma grande aglomeração. Aglomeração de trabalho, de pesquisa, de ensino, uma gigantesca aglomeração de conhecimento. E este ano nosso IBB faz mais um aniversário. Já são 57 anos de história. Mas esse aniversário é sem dúvidas não da forma como eu e você imaginávamos. Pois eu te pergunto, onde está todo mundo? Em meio a essa pandemia, fomos todos surpreendidos e de uma hora para outra transportados aqui para esse mundo virtual. Um mundo que a gente conhecia apenas como entretenimento, mas não era um mundo real para as nossas aulas, as nossas pesquisas e atividades de extensão. Até porque estávamos acostumados a conviver fisicamente, com os corredores, os departamentos, os laboratórios, sempre cheios. E aí, fomos todos virtualizados e nada mais era como a gente conhecia. Dá a impressão que perdemos a nossa identidade. Mas, na verdade, nós fomos desafiados. E, embora tenha sido muito difícil no começo, percebemos que temos uma imensa capacidade de mudar, pois criamos novas conexões e novas maneiras de nos comunicar. Aprendemos a aprender e vimos que somos resilientes. Cada um com o seu conhecimento, com sua dedicação, não mediu esforços para, num trabalho único, reconstruir o IBB que permanecesse além da sua estrutura física. Nós nos reinventamos. E nesse aniversário tão diferente, eu sei onde está todo mundo. Talvez nunca estivemos tão próximos. E com a certeza de que não importa qualquer outro desafio que nos espera, nós estaremos sempre aqui no IBB. Parabéns a todos nós! Nos dedicamos a ensinar, a inovar e a transformar por meio da ciência e da atuação social responsável. Essa é a missão. Há 45 anos, da Unesp, a Universidade Estadual Paulista. Uma jovem instituição, com 34 unidades, em 24 cidades do estado de São Paulo, 22 delas no interior, uma na capital e outra no litoral, em São Vicente. Essa ampla presença garante ensino de qualidade para mais de 50 mil alunos da graduação à pós-graduação. Estamos entre as universidades que mais produzem ciência no Brasil e temos orgulho de dialogar com as comunidades e compartilhar o resultado do nosso trabalho. Falar da Unesp é falar de todos e todas que ajudaram a tecer essa história em prol de um ensino público, inclusivo e de excelência. Trabalhamos diariamente para criar soluções e equipamentos para a comunidade científica, contribuindo com o avanço da pesquisa biomédica latino-americana. 
Nossa missão é maior do que somente fornecer equipamentos. É proporcionar segurança com atendimento de qualidade e principalmente com muito respeito e atenção. Por isso, investimos em alta tecnologia e buscamos manter relacionamentos duradouros. Nosso compromisso é ser um parceiro confiável que compreenda as necessidades, a realidade e as condições de cada cliente para assim oferecer a melhor solução sempre. Entendemos os benefícios da pesquisa científica para a humanidade e isso nos estimula. Se hoje temos melhor qualidade de vida, maior longevidade, se vencemos um câncer ou fazemos uso de um remédio para dor de cabeça, é porque o avanço da pesquisa biomédica nos permite. Confiamos no trabalho dos pesquisadores, na ciência e na comunidade científica. E nos orgulhamos em fazer a nossa parte. Assim como você, somos apaixonados. Ciência é o que nos move, porque para Alesco, pesquisa é para a vida.
Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to the, our audience. Thank you very much for your presence. My name is Natalia Feitosa, professor of Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and I will present the first speaker of the day, which is Professor Chang De Xiao from Taiwan. Professor Xiao is a full professor of Department of Bioscience Technology and the Director of Research Center for Aquatic Toxicology and Pharmacology. Professor from Chang Yang Christian University. Professor Xiao completed the undergraduate and graduate education in National Taiwan University in fishery science. Here, his postdoc was uh, done working on fish physiology and bioinformatics at, per, at Dr. Pampan Huang's group at EICOB Academia Sinica. By 2007, Professor Xiao established his own laboratory at Chongyang Christian University, where he <laughs> used the cutting edge methods of transgenic and genome editing to generate many zebrafish disease models like apoptosis, obesity, skin cancer, and aging. From 2012, Professor Xiao was invited by Gentex International Corporation, uh, Zijin Bio Biotech and Taikong Corporation as research consultant, consultant to initiate several cooperation projects on developing zebrafish antibodies, tiling CRISPR genome editing tools, transgenic fish, next generation sequencing technologies, as well as zebrafish behavioral assessment tools. From 2019, Professor Xiao was promoted as professor of Chongyang Christian University. Professor Xiao is author of over 200 high impact journal articles. His research interesting is to develop innovative and automatic tool on analyzing fish behavior and cardiac rhythm. And today, Professor Xiao will present the talk entitled Aging and Obesity Disease Models in Zebrafish. Thank you very much, Professor Xiao. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Can I start? Can I start it? Please. Okay. Thank so, uh, good morning, everybody, especially people in Brazil. Actually, come, uh, come up very early to listen to my talk. So today I would like to introduce my research work. The title will be the aging and obesity uh, disease model in zebra fish. And most of the research actually, uh, we are cooperation with the Taiwan company, like the Zijin company, Advanced Biotech, and also some microscopy uh, company and also antibody company from Gentex. And also my research supported by the funding from the Taiwan uh, government is called the uh, uh, Ministry of, of Science and Technology. I'm working in Zhongyuan Christian University. So before I started, uh, before my talk, I would like to share with some of my research interesting. Actually, you can search in the research gap. I'm interested in uh, have some keyword like the bioinformatics, like the genome editing, uh, for example, like the uh, new tool development. So we also uh, have organized a uh, research center is called Aquatic Toxicology and the Pharmacological uh, Center in uh, our university. So we can provide in the scientists in Taiwan or over the world to using some basic research model like the zebra fish or even like the invertebrate like the dolphinia as a research model to study the uh, ecotoxicity or the pharmacological uh, relevant study. And also we also invite uh, invention some uh, tool like the software that can do in some uh, automation uh, calculation of the some biological data. So as the yesterday, uh, several scientists has already mentioned why to use in zebra fish as a major platform to start it. So I have summarized the key point here. Uh, compared to the rodent, uh, zebra fish is much cheaper and also faster to get some uh, preliminary data. And also, especially in the embryonic stages, they are quite transparency in the body so that we can see some uh, internal organ development or some, we call the maybe deliver of some chemical or narrow particle into the zebra fish. And in addition, the zebra fish also have a lot of the new two invention, for example, like the transgenic tool or the, we call the genome editing. 
and also uh, with the help of the deep sequencing. So now the zebrafish already can done quite a lot of different research compared to the rodent. And the other interesting, I use in the zebrafish because the, uh, my first PhD thesis, the dissertation is using zebrafish to do the uh, transgenic uh, construction by the uh, adeno associated virus. So I actually I'm doing zebrafish more than 20 years. And also with the help of the total gateway system, actually this is invention by the uh, Professor Chibin Chen in Utah. So we're using this one to uh, construction a lot of the transgenic line. And also recently uh, with the help of the genome editing, either by Talon or by the CRISPR. So scientists in the world actually can uh, create a lot of the mutant even doing the CRISPR Cas9 screening yesterday already by uh, mentioned by the professor. So actually combine these two uh, several different uh, good advantage. So scientists that now can use in several fish to do a lot of different subject. But unfortunately, if you're doing the zebra fish, most of the KO fish scientists already uh, published a paper by the uh, Mainland China group in 2020 genome you know, research. So according to this paper, the title will be the like the systematic genome screening by the CRISPR-Cas9 on chromosome one, and they found in chromosome one is around maybe 1,300 different gene. And later they do the uh, we, we call the saturated uh, genome editing screening. Eventually, unfortunately, you can see here, I highlight in here, only 6.7% of the uh, gene being knocked out displays some embryonic phenotype. It means most of the gene, maybe more than 90% of the gene being knocked out actually display no phenotype in the embryonic stage. But whether the situation is real, actually we have to looking for the adult, because sometimes the adult a phenotype actually show, uh, show up very late. So if you make a conclusion, your gene being knocked out actually is no function, actually this is too risky. So how to start the gene function in adult is very, very difficult. So I just uh, doing some study. Uh, today, uh, the first topic I would like to show is the behavior of phenomics. This is the take advantage of the behavior. And we're doing the uh, high dimensional analysis by the phenomics approach. So this approach actually allow us to start it, the uh, behavior alteration in the whole organism level. And second topic I would like to share, we started for the uh, obesity. So this is done by the student actually using some transgenic and also using the genome editing to create some special transgenic line or the uh, KO line. And the, finally, I would like to show some cases of the, we call the uh, aging model. Okay, so let's get started for the first section, the behavior of phenomics. So what is the behavior of phenomics? Actually, the concept is very similar to the omics. It would be like the transgenic, transomics, transcriptome omics, uh, genomics, or proteomics. But the uh, end point, we are focused on the behavior. And using the behavior, the reason why we study the behavior, because the behavior is very sensitive compared to other end point. And also the behavior is very difficult to analysis. So we have to use in different uh, mathematics skill to analyze the complex data. And the behavior phenomics concept actually is coming from the rodent. As you can see this uh, 2019 paper, they just doing a lot of the different behavior testing, including the social interaction, including the swimming testing, including the social preference testing, and also including the, they just uh, with different uh, color, para, uh, color uh, compartment. So eventually they can use in the mathematic tool called the principal component analysis to sort in the behavior uh, pattern. For example, this one, we can see the C50BL6J mute uh, strength is different from the other strand. So the behavior started, especially for the behavior phenomics, is not all concept. We just adapted from the mouse. But how to conduct it, um, uh, behavior phenomics actually is quite complicated. 
the first you have to collect the data. So in this consideration, my student Gilbert already do some invention for using the a spatial uh, tank that able to uh, collect the several different endpoints from the single uh, video recording. After that, we have to dissecting the data by the mathematic method. For example, we're using the principal component assay. We're using the uh, hierarchy clustering and heat map analysis, and also do the Merkle dunking, and also using some uh, very uh, high-end, high-profiling uh, mathematic method called the factual dimension, and also the entropy analysis. And for example, you can see here, the ethanol is a, a solvent we are common using for uh, preparation of our chemical. We can find the high solution concentration of the ethanol. Actually, the fracture dimension, we are getting lower, but the entropy, we are getting higher. So it means, based on this mathematic tool, we are able to start it. The complicated uh, behavior of uh, uh, phenomics for the first time. So this is the key invention by my student. The first we published in 2018 is Invention. The title is the Adversative Setup for Measurement of Multiple Behavior in Zebra Fish. And later we invited by the current protocol in toxicology. This year we are published a paper to describe the detailed protocol for conducting the behavior phenomics step by step. So the paper already coming out, so you can uh, look in for detail, uh, to look in the detail uh, protocol in this paper. And briefly, I want to uh, introduction the data matrix. The data matrix will be looking like this one. The first column will be the behavior endpoint. And later is the behavior uh, uh, alteration in numerical number. And after that, we just summarize the data in the matrix Eventually, we can upload into some tool to analyze this, their uh, high dimensional uh, complexity reduction by the principal analysis. So this data have to summarize in this table first. Later can be analyzed by mathematic method. Uh, how good of this phenomics can be done? My student testing several different cases. The first that we testing for the mutation uh, we're testing several mutations. Later, I will report to you. So it's working. And later, we're testing for the different pollution. So my student testing like the uh, graphene, graphene oxide, or like the, some uh, we call the narrow particle, it's working. And later, my student testing for different strain, mutant. For example, like the AB strain, like some uh, like the weak strain, like the tubing long fin, absolute, or golden. So we can uh, distinguish their behavior differences based on our uh, model. And eventually we also apply this method to another species is called the metaka. The metaka actually is quite closely to the zebra fish, but their behavior is seldom be started. So my student also using the behavior phenomenon to study the metaka different species behavior alteration differences. So I move into the second topic. We'll be using the fish as a, a obesity model. So the obesity, we have to uh, looking for what's going on between in the rodent. Actually in the rodent, uh, they have some very, we call the typical model for obesity started, including the OBOB -OB mice or the DBDB -DB mice. So these mice actually are uh, genetic diffusion in the leptin or leptin receptor. So compared to the mouse, the fish recently also be started have several mutants uh, equivalent to the OBOB -OB or DBDB allele. But in the long time ago, for example, uh, maybe 10 years ago, there are a few models can modeling. So some people use transgenic approach to overexpression, some uh, neuropeptide called the AGRP in the brain so this AGRP is a hormone to regulation the, the food intake. So once the AGRP overexpression, the fish got good appetite. So they were eating a lot of the atemia, eventually they get fat. So according to this literature survey, so my student maybe already uh, doing this project 10 years ago. So using the very famous gene called the AKT. 
So why will we send the AKT? Because the AKT is an important hub, hub for the insulin, or the we call the PI3K kinase pathway. And AKT activation actually can phosphorylate the downstream gene like the CREP or like the SREPP1. And later, these two hub will activate a lot of the downstream event. For example, the PPA gamma or the CEP alpha uh, feedback loop eventually can boost in the adipogenesis or the lipogenesis. So my idea is using the AKT over expression. Maybe we all have the chance to see the obesity phenotype. And very luckily, my student already got publication 2012 in the PLOS one. So this paper is the first paper to describe, uh, describe the lipoma phenotype. So once we over expression uh, AKT, we found uh, some uh, lipid uh, protruding close to the, maybe uh, in the head or in their uh, faces here. We can see some adipo tissue protruding out. After we standing by the uh, oil rest standing, we uh, validate this uh, protruding tissue is the lipid tissue. So after that, we confirm this is the lipoma uh, model, but not obesity model. So we move on to the second study. We want to create the, the really uh, obesity model. So we are looking for the mouse study. We found the leptin or the leptin receptor signal is very important because you can see here the OB, OB mice is very obese compared to the wild type. So what is the leptin? The leptin actually is the hormone secreting by the adipocyte. And the other gene with different function is called the garin. So this is the uh, peripheral hormone secreted by the, from the uh, adipocyte. But in the brain, we have the AGRP, also have the PMOC. So let's uh, have the interplay between the uh, brain neuron and the, the peripheral leptin secretion feedback loop. And we're looking for the phylogenetic tree we can find in the mammal, there's only one leptin gene. But according to the topology of the tree topology, we found in the fish, they have two leptin genes called leptin A or the leptin B. So according to this data, so we know the zebrafish providing very good opportunity to dissecting the leptin duplicate gene. So in this consideration, uh, my student are starting to create a leptin knockout. And after literature survey, we found the leptin in addition to the obesity, they also play a role in the behavior control because in the rodent, once the leptin be uh, injected into the rodent, actually the, uh, the, uh, the anxiety level, the depression level can be uh, blocked. So according to this uh, previous study, we know the leptin in addition to the hepatitis control, maybe also control for the be uh, behavior or the anxiety. But before our study, we're looking for the previous paper published in 2016. It's in the PNS, actually they already described the uh, phenotype for the leptin A, leptin B, or leptin receptor knockout. The conclusion is the zebrafish homolog. The function is different from the mammalian because after they knock out all of the leptin or leptin -re relevant gene, actually there's no obesity, no any uh, relevant phenotype compared to the mammal. So in this PNS paper, may, the conclusion may be the leptin is not for the uh, obesity control. Maybe they just for the like the regulation of the adipo status. But after this paper be published, we are looking for another paper in the uh, Medaka. Actually, in the Medaka, they also knock out the leptin receptor by the Japanese group, but they got typical obesity phenotype, especially their food intake is quite high. So according to these two paper, we hypothesize maybe the previous uh, zebrafish paper, maybe the uh, knockout allele is not so stronger. So in this consideration, we would like to uh, create more uh, mutant that maybe have the phenocopy of the obesity phenotype. So the result is yes. My student actually uh, already uh, knocked out the leptin A gene 
and we found uh, zebrafish is very obese phenotype and also have a lot of the uh, behavior abnormality that will be not be reported in the rodent before. For example, we found the knuckle leptin A fish, actually their aggression level very low. Their social uh, showing area become uh, bigger and their fear uh, to the predator reduction. And also their appetite, appetite is getting higher. So they got obesity phenotype. And also their circadian reason getting lower. So this behavior is the new finding based on this leptin A gene mutation. So according to this picture, we know the zebrafish knockout, actually this is the four best mutation. And the protein got truncation. So supposedly the protein function will be got some uh, blocking. But after we uh, create the mutant line, we found their morphology is quite similar to the wild type because we do the morphometric uh, analysis as there's no significant differences on the morphometric analysis but they are quite bigger because they got obesity. So next we measurement for the uh, body important hormone called leptin, because leptin A already been knocked out. So we using the ELISA to measurement their protein content. We found the leptin content getting lower and the leptin receptor on the other hand got overshooting, getting higher. And the other gene important for the uh, appetite is called the HRP, gearing, getting higher. And most importantly, you can find here the glucose level getting very high because the unbalance of the, maybe the insulin level getting lower. So based on this criteria, actually we can measure for their uh, insulin resistance based on the HOMO IR. The HOMO IR is the uh, insulin resistance index will be uh, glucose level multiplied with the insulin level uh, divided with 405 milligram per deal. So according to this data, we know the leptin AKO fish really have the obesity phenotype. And even they got the insulin resistant phenotype in, in this data showing here. And later we testing the unknown, uh, didn't report it by the rodent data. We just showed the uh, we just showed the uh, the fish actually their behavior got very uh, faster moving, and we call they have the typical uh, we call the hypoactive uh, phenotype, and you can see the phenotype here. We found. And we found uh, actually their hyperactivity, actually we hypothesis maybe their ATP level getting higher. But after we doing the measurement of the body ATP, we found actually the ATP level or the creating kinase very low. So this very uh, interesting phenomenon, this interesting phenomenon, we just doing the another testing for the, uh, we call the, serotonin. The serotonin level also very low. So actually the fish got hyperactivity, but with the low ATP, low serotonin. So we uh, may be thinking the fish uh, hyperactivity is caused by the food graphing behavior because they're very hungry. They are thinking for their food. So they are moving faster. And later we also testing for their glycine level very high. So the glycine level is important for the aggressiveness. So after that, we testing for the mirabitin. So the mirabitin, we found they are less ag aggression on mirabitin behavior. And later we testing for their uh, predator avoidance. So the predator avoidance, we put the predator here and the zebra fish here or obesity fish here. We found the leptin KO fish were approaching to the predator quite often. So what's the reason for the approaching to the predator quite often? We measurement for their, uh, we call the no epinephrine level. 
because no epinephrine is important for the fear of fear behavior we call the fight or flight. So make uh, this uh, no epinephrine very low. So this can explain why the fish no fear to their predator. It's quite often to challenge their predators here. And finally, we testing for their social interaction. And we found the social interaction between two zebra fish is no differences. And also we testing for the shoring. The shoring is mean uh, maybe three fish uh, swimming together. And we found the Latin KO, the shoring area become loosened. You can see here become loosened compared to the compact in the wild type. And later, my student also invention a very special uh, instrument called the circadian chamber. So we already published the paper in the uh, biological open. So the circadian chamber in adult, we can measurement for the locomotion activity in the morning, also in the night by the infrared CCD. So after doing that, my student found the Latin KO got very hyperactivity, not only in the morning, also in the night. It means they are never sleep in the night. They are quite aggressive in the night. So what is the reason they got no sleeping? So we measurement for important hormone unmediated uh, circadian reason is the melatonin. And we found the leptin KO fish, the leptin level very low. So this one is the maybe the primary reason for the hyperactivity of the fish in the night. And we also testing for the color preference because my students set up the uh, instrument can measurement for the color preference for zebra fish. So after we measurement, we found the color preference index get, getting lower. So what's the meaning for the color preference getting lower? So this is mean they got no interest in, maybe got depression. So depression, they got less, less interest in for the color. So we measurement for the serotonin getting lower. And it, finally, we are wondering because the security reason got the regulation, maybe their sleep or their memory got worse. But after we doing the, we call the pace avoidance testing, the short-term memory, no differences. But interesting, although the memory still maintained here according to the latency, but the acetylcholine or the acetylcholine esterase level getting very low. So it means maybe the fish already got uh, in the margin of the deep, uh, memory loss. Maybe waiting for longer time, they will get memory loss according to the ELISA data of the biomarker. So this is the uh, summary for the second talk. We using the talent to create a mutant of the leptin A. After that, we found a typical obesity phenotype. We also testing for the behavior, we found very interesting, never be reported the uh, uh, behavior alteration for the first time in the leptin A, KO fish. And also we measurement for the brain uh, ROS level, free radical, catalyst level left very low, and importantly, the cortisol level getting higher. So this one can explain why the fish got hyperactivity anxiety because their cortisol level become getting higher. And in the third part, I would like to share you with the new finding of our study in the agent field. So this is my review article. We review for the re, uh, agent relevant paper. You can see from uh, 2003 to 2019. So the agent related paper, uh, the number getting higher, especially in the zebra fish. And the other fish, few paper be reported, but the zebra fish is the majority. So why zebrafish become so popular? Because they have the uh, genetic tool like the genome editing, transgenic, or deep sequencing tool. And several uh, mutation already been reported, including the telomerase uh, uh, knockout fish. Also have the lamidin A uh, fish. Also including my uh, paper, uh, the PYCR1 uh, mutation, I will tell you today. So this paper is done by my poster, uh, published in 2019 in the cells. So this data, uh, interesting part is that we create a mutant for the PYCR1 first, first time, and later we testing their aging, also including the behavior abnormality. 
So this research actually we are cooperating with the uh, Makai Memorial Hospital in Taiwan. So they have the, some clinical patient show very uh, premature aging phenotype. We call the progeroid uh, phenotype. So this phenotype actually uh, already be positioned currently to found the gene corresponding to the aging is the PYCR1 gene and the hotspot in several different axons but the, ma uh, the major axon will be located in axon six because the axon six play an uh, important role for the reductase activity. So once the axon six start mutation, so the PYCR1 uh, enzyme activity will compromise. So what is the molecular mechanism for the PYCR1 mutation? So we're looking for the uh, biochemical uh, pathway. So the PYCR1 gene is in here so play an important role to convert it, the glutamate to the pollen. So the uh, two enzymes play an important role on this conversion. One is the PYCS, is the synthetase. The other one is the reductase. So once this gene be compromised, be mutated, so we can expect it, the pollen level will get in, uh, lower. But the proline play a very important role for the collagen fiber formation and also for elastin fiber formation. So once the proline level getting lower, you can expect it, our collagen and the elastin got some problem. So this is the primary phenotype for the progeroid uh, mutation in human. You got very uh, a soft, uh, uh, we call the collagen tissue formation. So the people cannot grow very uh, higher, very tall. And also they got skin very relaxed and also got uh, the agent phenotype. So based on this data, we designed some uh, uh, talent uh, cassette that we knock out the gene for the zebrafish PYCR1. So actually in zebrafish, actually they got several duplication of the PYCR1, PYCR2, PYCR3, and the PYC-like, PR-like gene. So actually we uh, designed some talent pair to knock out all of the gene, but PYCR1 is the most interesting one, so we report it first. So the PYCR1, we got two best pair mutation here. After that, they got the, uh, we call the protein truncation, become very short. It can be considered as a null allele. And their reductase domain uh, already been knocked out, and their uh, NAD, NADP domain is also deficient. So based on this uh, prediction, we found this fish maybe is uh, play, uh, can be using as a model to study the PYCR loss of function. After that, we're doing the uh, several different uh, assay, including the tunnel assay, like the apoptosis assay, senescence beta gel is the aging assay. And we found the fish really got very aging phenotype, you can see here. In the early stage, only around two months, already displayed the, uh, the blue color standing for the senescent beta gel. And also to the, uh, around maybe six months, already get the typical agent phenotype. And importantly, their mortality rate is very high compared to the wild type. The wild type maybe can survive for two years, but the PYC are mutant only maybe half a year. And the most important, we dissecting the, uh, the retina we found they got retina disorganized of the cell nuclei. So according to this one, we know the PYCR1 fish display, we call the accelerated agent phenotype. And what is going on for the biomarker, we do a lot of the ELISA uh, screening because we're doing the antibody screening. We got a lot of the antibody uh, can be applied for zebra fish and we just coding in the ELISA plate so we can do in the ELISA screening. And I just want to tell you the, the final result. The result is very interesting. The proline level getting lower because the PYCR is important for the proline synthesis. So the proline level getting lower. And the other one is the, uh, the right uh, proline is called hydroxyproline also getting lower. And after that, we testing uh, the senescent beta gear getting higher and telomerase activity getting lower, energy very low, and uh, catalase very low, superoxidized uh, demerase very low, and the total 
oxygen capacity getting lower. So according to this uh, ELISA marker, we know the fish got problem for the oxidative stress. After that, we're doing the same with the phenomics. Again, by the phenomics, because the phenomics is very powerful, so we're using the homozygous mutant to test him for the normal tank. So the normal tank showing the fish got quite high proactivity. It means their average speed and their locomotion activity getting lower. And also, they are not quite often to visit in the upper tank. It means they always stay in the bottom. So this is also a sign of the anxiety. After that, we test in for the mirror biting. The mirror biting, you can, according to this picture, you can see the trajectory. They are quite less visiting for the mirror. So this is the typical, we call the less aggressiveness phenotype, according to this uh, picture here. And later the fish, we uh, challenge you with the predator, predator. We found they don't fear for the predator, but controlled fish is quite fear for the predator. So they almost know any uh, timing uh, approaching to the approaching zone. I show the color in red, uh, in, in yellow here. But according to the panel show you here, they are quite often to visit in, in the PYCR1 mutant. This is quite uh, unusual. And later we test in for social. Social may be no different. And uh, showing they got more uh, not so high often to showing because they got hyperactivity. They are moving activity very low. And later we're testing for the circadian. The circadian is also got problem for the sleeping. Uh, when the transition from the day to the night, is the fish got high search for the local activity in the night. And also we're testing for the melatonin, also got some problem. So the PYCR1 also have the circadian reason dis dysregulation and also have the uh, melatonin reduction problem. So I would like to make summarize for what we are finding of the PYCR1. First, we create a mutant by the talent pair. After that, we're doing a lot of uh, set of the biochemical uh, signature uh, collection. We found the PYCR1 got problem for the oxidative stress. And also the morphological got significant uh, alteration because of the aging problem, especially for the lifespan very short. Eventually we explore for the possible behavior alteration by the phenomics. We found this fish got a very severe reduction in the aggressiveness, also in the predator avoidance, and also got high anxiety level. And finally, we also using another uh, mutation we already got published. For example, we got the publication for the DMMT3AA and DNMT3AB. These two genes is the DNA messier transferase gene is, is important for the epigenetic uh, methylation. And uh, also we have the LPR, AR3. This is the, we call the lipophosphatic AC receptor three we knock out the fish. And by the advantage of the phenomics, we are able to comparison uh, their behavior different by the, all of the data matrix. So the important one we found uh, after we doing the clustering, we found two big clustering. One is by the DMMT3AA, LPR3, and also POICR1 mutant here. And the other clustering is the lepta A, DMMT3AB. So what is the difference between these two clusters, across whom the behavior you can see, the leptin A and leptin uh, DMMT3AB, they are quite high in this phenomena. In here is the, we call the blue color code. The blue color code is the novel tank behavior. So according to this uh, fingerprinting like pattern, we are able to distinguish the behavior differences between different lines according to a lot of the different behavior endpoint, maybe more than 20 different endpoint combination. So according to the slide, we can know the powerful uh, of the phenomics approach to start it, of the behavior of uh, abnormality in different mutant. 
And most of the mutant didn't show any uh, embryonic phenotype. So finally, I would like to make the conclusion of my talk today. So this is the take home message for you for my, for my talk. The first one, keep in mind the behavior uh, phenomics is a new approach. And this approach can start the behavior at the whole organism level with the very high sensitivity compared to the previous uh, toxicity or the uh, or, or other testing based on biomarker or by the uh, sub different method like the, uh, at the cell level. And secondly, the behavior uh, phenomics is required a high level mathematics approach, like the principal component analysis, like the hierarchy clustering, like the, we call the uh, entropy and also the uh, fraction dimension. So this one, we already built up some uh, tool in the lab. So we welcome for cooperation. We already overcome the problem for the uh, complicated mathematics calculation. And third one is the behavior phenomics. Actually, it's uh, already succeed, successfully applied to analyze two mutant, one for obesity, one for aging. And finally, I would like to highlight the behavior phenomics may be able to uncover more phenotype in zebrafish, because I already told you, most of the zebrafish display no obvious embryonic phenotype. So most of the scientists will give up because there's no phenotype. But if you fish got no phenotype, you can pass to me. By my phenomics, maybe you can see some phenotype. So this is my motivation to do some international cooperation. And also we're providing full scholarship for the young scientists in coming to Taiwan. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, I will happy to take your question. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much, Professor Xiao. It was a great talk and a very inspiring as well at the end. If the person doesn't have a phenotype, please contact you. I will probably have one of them. <laughs> and uh, before we start the questions, I would like to give an um, announcement to the audience that are asking about the certificates. The link for the certificates will be available only at the end of this day. So then you can click on that uh, by the end of our last presentation that should be in the afternoon. And okay, Professor, we should start the questions. Pierre Olivier Ungrand is asking, have you compared the activity of young and aged fish using your phenomic assay? Okay, thank you for your question, very good. Actually, we testing for the younger fish for the behavior, but we found the fish, if they are too younger, most of the behavior not display very well because like the memory, like the showing, maybe they will be show up after maybe one month or two months. So for your lava fish, for example, you define for the lava fish, maybe just in the day seven, most of the behavior cannot be started in my method. But you can use it another, like the locomotion checking or like the photomotor activity changes, you still can do some phenomic study. But today I present is purely based on the adult fish. So this is the new approach I already uh, mentioned to you uh, by using the adult fish only, especially for the age around maybe six months to uh, 10 months old. Yeah, and the more elder fish is also not good for the behavior uh, assessment. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, Larissa uh, Vendramini uh, says, thanks for the lecture, Dr. Uh, Chung. I was wondering, why did you prefer using talent instead of CRISPR? Well, 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 Larissa, good question. Actually, we're doing both of them. But because the talent invention much earlier, maybe one or two years earlier than CRISPR, so most of the study I'm doing is using the talent because we're doing a uh, very long time ago. 
And also, you know, the mutation take long time to keep to the homozygous. So most of the mutant I present today are using the talent. But we also have a lot of the mutant you created by CRISPR. And in my uh, knowledge, both of the two are working uh, uh, the same good, especially for the talent, the of target effects very low. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another question from Camila Moreira. Considering the hormonal changes, have you seen any fertility reproductive phenotype in this model? In phenomic analysis, can you evaluate reproductive behavior? Well, okay, Camila, good question. Uh, for the, we call the fertility real, they got some problem. Because my, mut uh, my mutation, for example, like the LEPA A or the PYCR1, they only have very short window can production the embryo. After they're getting uh, elder, like the PYCR mutation, you are difficult to bring the embryo. So definitely I found they got the reproduction problem. So the two gene, like the leptin A or the PYCR, I believe also play a role on the reproductive organ. Yeah, good question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I also have a question. Uh, I did not understand very well the oh, how you consider fish obese because you mentioned that the morphometrics are quite similar, but they are bigger. So you define by the lipids, uh, the, the fat cells or by muscles because they are also more active. Yeah. For the obesity, you have to testing a lot of biomarkers according to the rodent started. Because in the rodent, the obesity, they have the visceral uh, fat accumulation. So you have to do the tissue section. Also doing some like the oil ray, oil standing, and also doing the uh, some uh, like the ELISA testing in the blood or in the whole body to testing some marker because the obesity, they got some, uh, we call the uh, hormone de uh, dysregulation, like the leptin, leptin receptor or insulin. So we collect a lot of data. Also, we also measurement you, you maybe keep in mind is the hormone IR insulin resistant marker. So based on this one, we definitely, we can say that is the obesity phenotype, but they are all looking still quite similar to the wild type because the morpho morphometrics, uh, analysis based on uh, the outlooking of the different whole marker of the body looking. So maybe they just make enlargement uh, symmetrically. Yeah, so the overall the morphometrics, there are no differences. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And do you have any data about leptin B? Well, actually we got leptin B, but unfortunately already we get published by the other group. Because you know the field is quite competitive, yes. so recently already be published by maybe the, the other professor like the uh, Hammer, something something like that in the European group, and also some paper published in other group, but they maybe didn't touch for the behavior. So actually we still got some uh, space to do in, yeah. Otherwise for the embryonic phenotype is too very competitive. <laughs> Everybody doing the study. Yes, sure. thank you very much. We have more questions if you don't mind. Yes, yes, welcome. Um, Sivaranjani uh, Hajagol Pao said, a very informative talk, sir. Have you done any work on telomerase to develop aging model in zebrafish? Uh, the telomere uh, started the telomere gene already been knocked out by several different groups. Yeah, so the outcome is the uh, very typical agent model. So in my study, I just testing the telomere activity by my ELISA antibody uh, standing or the uh, quantification. And we found the telomere activity is really low in my PYCR1 knockout fish. Yeah, so anybody if interested on the ELISA, testing can contact with me. We got a lot of the ELISA panel, maybe more than 200 different antibody in the lab can do in the ELISA testing. Thank you. 
Now yeah. we have a question from Sofia de Oliveira. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for the great talk. Does the obesity model or the aging one show markers of immunosuppression or susceptibility to infections? Okay, thank you for your last talk. Actually, we are not uh, address for the immunosuppression, but actually I indeed testing some biomarker like the interleukin one beta or the tumor necrosis alpha. Actually, they also got the upregulation of the inflammation marker. And also in previous model, we also uh, increased in the fish with the neutral field or the macrophage field line. We found they got the local inflammation phenotype. So I believe the fish also got the uh, inflammation problem. Thank you. Great. And we go to the last question. We are running out of time. From Hong Yun Shen. Uh, this is because with embryos, you can tap on the large repertoires of transgenic lines available to further characterize uh, the molecular mechanisms of the invaluable mutants you have created. Uh, it is a, mainly a suggestion. <laughs> can you? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Hong Yan. Actually, uh, my mutant or the transgene line all of deposit in the Taiwan Zebrafish Stock Center. Yeah, so everybody want to get the uh, uh, doing can request from the Taiwan Zebrafish Stock Center so we can share the fish line. Or if you have line in hand, want to do the behavior, a phenomics testing also can contact with me. I can do in some testing, maybe for free. Yeah, just want to do some cooperation to see how powerful of my uh, behavior phenomics too. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for this yeah. interesting uh, talk and very informative and with possibilities for new collaborations. So, but now we are moving to the next step. Thank you very much, Professor. Now uh, we are going to present the sponsors, the videos and uh, uh, another presentation. Stay tuned. Thank you very much. Please, Tommaso, if you want, you can start. Oh, thank you very much, and thanks for the for the invitation. Um, so, in the context of the of the webinar, uh, I would like to show. Um, three of the latest uh, product innovation that Techniplast developed for the mainly for the um, housing and uh, health uh, monitor of zebrafish. So this is the the standalone. Standalone is, uh, as you can see, a self-standing unit uh, suitable for uh, being used as a, as a quarantine or uh, as a, a single unit for uh, a medium small. Uh, uh, facility. What we did uh, was to improve the, the overall working principle of the of the system and include uh, uh, a, a self-cleaning mechanical uh, filtration by means uh, of a drum filter. Drum filters are very much used in aquaculture are um, self-cleaning mechanical filters which basically embed uh, in, uh, in themselves, uh, the pre-filtration and the mechanical filtration with a significant uh, uh, reduction of uh, use of consumables, so basically they are consumables free, and so this reduces the yearly running costs, uh, reduces the labor uh, associated to the replacement, uh, the cons and consequently the, the potential animal uh, stress, and so a better fish welfare uh, and a better research. So this is uh, how the drum filter works. Uh, basically, the drum filter works by gravity and not by pressure. So the mesh filters water. As soon as the mesh gets clogged, the water level inside the drum raises. Uh, and so the mo a motor uh, rotates the drum uh, and exposes the dirty side of the drum uh, to a, a jet of uh, clean water, which basically cleans the water and the dirty water goes uh, directly to the drain. What we did uh, was also to provide uh, the, the highest uh, uh, disinfection power possible, knowing the fact that recirculating systems uh, uh, are not completely sterile. Actually, they provide a very high filtration uh, and, uh, and disinfection. And so 
what we provide uh, is also a very good uh, uh, mechanical filtration at uh, 26 uh, micron, which reduces the, uh, the amount of solids uh, uh, meeting the, uh, the UV lamp. Uh, and also, as you can see in the picture, we provide a UV lamp entirely made of uh, 369 stainless steel, which makes uh, the UV lamp body basically everlasting. Uh, we, we improved also the kind of uh, uh, biomedia. So biomedia is, and biofiltration are important for uh, oxidizing ammonia into less toxic compounds. In this case, we are using plastic floating biochips, uh, which uh, provide uh, uh, the highest uh, colonization, uh, colonizing surface possible to the beneficial nitrifying bacteria, as well uh, as uh, to reduce the possibility to uh, dirt uh, and, and biofilm to stick uh, on uh, uh, standard uh, submerged biofilm. In this case, we use a water jet, uh, of course, to keep uh, these plastic uh, uh, chips moving. Uh, a a uh, touchscreen is always uh, uh, recommended. In this case, we provided uh, a, a nice looking touchscreen for great visibility, ease of use. And the system includes, of course, standard probes for temperature, pH, and conductivity, as well as the possibility to upgrade the system at any time with an additional probe, which is used to monitor the concentration of total dissolved gases. There is the possibility to download data, um, um, send email messages, uh, uh, send, uh, sorry, alarms uh, as email messages and also to remote uh, and control uh, the, the touchscreen from, uh, from remote, so from uh, um, a laptop uh, or uh, a mobile phone. So the, the structure is uh, made of 316 L stainless steel epoxy coated. Uh, the system is compatible to any tank uh, we provide, so like the 1.1, uh, 2.4, 3.5, 8 liter, as well as the new large 16 liter tank without the need of replacing manifolds. We use a dedicated uh, unique plastic uh, on-off valve to control the flow with uh, the possibility to uh, fine tuning uh, the flow and then acting on the frontal nozzle to start and stop the flow. There is no, there is no need of hoses as uh, the, uh, the tip of the nozzle protrudes directly into the lid. Each, uh, our tanks, especially the 3.5, 8 liter and 16 liter are equipped with active siphons, unique in the market, which actively remove dirt, water, and of course dirt from the bottom of the tanks in an active way in order to, uh, to enhance the, the self-cleaning from the tank and so to increase the time tanks are on, uh, on, the, on the system. Uh, each tank sits on a dedicated runner, which is a standard black or enriched with, uh, um, with a background based on uh, a, sp a scientific uh, uh, dedicated paper, which demonstrated the preference for fish uh, of fish for uh, an enriched uh, bottom. Uh, this is the uh, so-called Z Park, a new uh, tank for the long-term housing of adult uh, zebrafish. As you can see, it's quite different from, from standard tank, it's a completely different approach for the welfare of fish, as well as to provide shallow water and enhance the swimming behavior of fish more in horizontal, which is more natural, of course, rather than in vertical. Uh, the system provides a dedicated uh, water inlet from the bottom and not from the top, uh, and uh, at the um, at the left corner, there are three siphons enhancing and guaranteeing the self-cleaning from the tank. This uh, tank is, of course, retrofitable at any time, uh, removing standard tanks. It feeds uh, Techniplast uh, uh, Rex, uh, and of course, this tank can accommodate quite a larger number of fish when the tank is completely uh, free. Uh, as you can see, in this case, uh, we also give fish the possibility to breed whenever we want, uh, specifically to maintain uh, the proper uh, 
um, breeding fitness and performances of fish. So by inserting this breeding uh, insert, fish are free to, smooth, uh, to swim on top of it if they want, if they are not ready or if they don't want to breed, of course, they, they, are, uh, they are free not to do it. And then uh, eggs uh, are, are collected in, uh, in a dedicated uh, tray, which is included uh, in, the, uh, in the footprint of, uh, of the breeding uh, platform. Uh, and, uh, and, and so this uh, uh, helps uh, in, uh, in collecting eggs uh, quite easily. We finish this last uh, couple of minutes talking about Interzeptec. Interzeptec is a new approach uh, course validated uh, to the uh, zebrafish health monitoring which is based uh, on uh, an environmental biological uh, um, approach. So Interzeptec is the vertical column uh, you see which includes three filtering sections uh, which is included uh, in, uh, in, a, in a cylinder which is basically an holder to be installed uh, on, uh, on Rex. Uh, Interzeptec is provided in dedicated boxes of five, five pieces each, and each Interzeptec filter is uh, sealed uh, in, uh, in a dedicated uh, um, irradiated box. So to validate Interzeptec, uh, we, we tested uh, a unit uh, for more than uh, 12 uh, months, uh, exposing Interzeptec at different uh, intervals, uh, uh, minimum five weeks uh, to seven weeks. Uh, nowadays, we are going up to 12 weeks uh, in specific time. Of course, the, the, uh, the exposure time depends on the number of fish, uh, feeding, uh, and, uh, and so on. So we were able to detect uh, the standard uh, uh, or, or um, uh, the very same uh, pathogens uh, um, found uh, using standard PCR on fish, detritus, uh, and some tank biofilm swabs. In addition, uh, you can see uh, pretty much the remaining uh, mycobacteria as well as uh, pseudocapillaria tomentosa and pseudoloma neurophilia, which are not uh, as easy to be detected from, uh, from a standard sampling uh, of, uh, of fish and, uh, and detritus. In addition, we were able to detect the picornavirus and a couple more of uh, uh, microorganisms which had never been uh, validated before. So to install uh, Interzeptec is quite, uh, is quite easy. You need a dedicated connect connector plug made of 369 stainless steel, install Interzeptec, uh, of course, from the bottom all water will flow and we are able to filter up to 400, 500 liters of water every day. And of course, as soon as the exposure time is, uh, is finished, uh, we, sorry, we, are, uh, we, we, are, uh, we, we can collect uh, Interzeptec and, uh, and slide it into a dedicated falcon tube, so a standard falcon tube from, from a lab, and then make uh, the, the sample ready, both for PCR or for uh, also bacteriology, because uh, using a dedicated carrier media, we can, uh, we can send these to a dedicated lab, which is at the moment is IDEX, who, of course, validated the technology for, uh, for the analysis. And uh, as I said, you can choose between uh, PCR uh, with the panel of microorganisms that you like. And uh, in addition, you can also um, test for uh, uh, bacteriology. OK, so this was, uh, this was a quick uh, quick, uh, uh, of course, in introduction to, uh, to us. I hope, uh, I hope you enjoyed and I remain available for uh, any question you may have. Thank you very much, Tommaso. You're welcome uh, to, to be here. And is this Interceptec sent to where? Is it done in Brazil as well or? Yeah, yeah. Uh I mean, uh, the, with, uh, with Techniplast, uh, we, have, uh, we have distributors. Of course, uh, uh, we, we have a, a distributor in, uh, in Brazil as well. 
So it's uh, it's a matter then uh, for you to to organize uh, the, the shipment of the sample uh, to in this case to IDEX. So for the time being, uh, IDEX uh, is the company who developed uh, uh, the, the the specific uh, um, the specific uh, uh, procedure for uh, for collecting uh, the, the the samples which are basically biofilm and uh, and debris and extracted in the, the nucleic acids for uh, for the analysis okay great thank you very much for being here uh, now we are moving to uh, the videos of uh, other sponsors and yeah, see you in 15 minutes My name is Monica Rodrigues Ferreira Machado, and I'm the coordinator of the Laboratory of Biotechnology and Physiology in Fish, Lab Fish, at Federal University of Jataí, Goiás. I was invited to introduce you to Science Lab or Zebra Fish Equipment for Maintenance and Experimentation. This company aims to be recognized as a company of excellence in the national and international markets for manufacturing high-tech equipment with a commitment to continuous improvement of these products. The most important is the ability of this enterprise to adapt those products to the researchers' need. Science Lab could produce mountain stains, UV amber chambers and recirculation sisters, and the amber chamber allows you to control temperature, fault period, and humidity in a sterile environment, providing a safe and suitable place for the development of embryos. In our tests, there was a greater viability of those embryos than those kept in germination chambers. In addition, this was, there was no receipt of cans in 96 well plates for 188 hours. Mountain stains or aquarium are made of polycarbonate with colors translucent blue or green and can be autoclave with rounded walls that make it difficult to accumulate food debris or algae. In addition, the larger opening in the lid allows you to attach automatic feeders and facilitate the feeding process. Recirculation racks are modular with a canister type filter system and this system prevents water leakage, water leakage. It is also built in individual models, which allows isolation by lines. Also contain UV light, temperature control, and circadian rhythm. OpenFS is an open platform for electrophysiological recording of unit activities and local field activity in animals, with the potential to expand for use in human electroencephalography. It allows records of up to 512 channels with the cost of the complete system up to 10 times less than commercial products. The most important of this company is the ability to adapt to researcher needs. Thank you.
Welcome back to all. Bienvenidos. Uh, Bienvenidos, né? Uh, the link for the certificates, just to remind you, the link of the certificates of today's talks will be available only at the end of our last talk, so in the, in the afternoon. Okay. Uh, but now, our second speaker of the day is Professor Flavio Zolesi. The main position is Associate Professor in Cell Biology, Universidad de la República Uruguay. And the other position is Associate Researcher at the Institute Pasteur Montevideo. He has done his bachelor from the University of Republic of Uruguay, Master and PhD in Biological Science in Pedeciba, Program of Development of Basic Science Uruguay. Has received several awards and honorary positions in Uruguay and in the United Kingdom. And Professor Zalesi is present in many scientific societies to spread scientific knowledge and encourage young scientists in Latin America. As the Neuroscience Society, of Uruguay as vice president. Uh, he's in the Latin American Zebrafish Network coordinating committee and the board member of Latin American Society for Developmental Biology. Professor Zolesi research is focused on the relationship between cell polarity and neural differentiation in vertebrates, concentrating on polarity transition processes such as those found during neurulation and neuronal differentiation. For this, he uses experimental systems in vertebrates, such as zebrafish and chicken. And today, Professor Zalesi will present the talk entitled Studying Neuronal Differentiation in Vivo in Zebrafish. Thank you very much, Professor Zalesi. And you can start whenever. Good morning. Thank you, Natalia, and thank you all the all the organizers, Yves, and Rafael, for the for the invitation. It's, it's really really great. I would love to be there in Brazil, not here, but anyway, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's, a, it's been a great meeting so far, so I, I'm really honored to be part of this. Okay, so I will now uh, share my screen, hopefully. So yeah, there it comes. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to tell you today, as Natalia said, uh, is related particularly to, to one of the main main uh, lines, research lines we have in the lab related to uh, the, the regulation of neuronal differentiation um, related to, to, to cell polarity in, 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 in vertebrates. And particularly for this, uh, I will show you, we work on several fish. So the main uh, structure we are interested in, the main cells, we are interested in neurons, but mainly we have been uh, largely working on, on the retina, uh, on, uh, on the neural retina, where we have this uh, very particular array of, of neurons uh, starting from the, from the photoreceptors, which are, as we will say, we will see very, very uh, strange neurons as, as themselves uh, are, have, have some, some other particularities in addition to, to normal neuron uh, um, features. And then we have interneurons, and then we have a projection neuron, which is a retinal, retinal ganglion cell. So the, this structure, which is uh, relatively simple compared to other parts of the, of the central nervous system, uh, has some also some particular things, like it is uh, very, very closely associated to, to an epithelium, which is the, the retinal pigmented epithelium, which is on top of, of of the retina here, and both uh, structures are related through the apical uh, surfaces, while the bas basal surfaces are pointing outward. Um, so we have a basal lamina on one side and a basal lamina on the other side, and that's a, a bit of a. So this would be what is the ventricles uh, in, in in other regions of the central nervous system. Neurons here in this uh, organ derive from the cells, like in any part of, of the central nervous system of, of, of vertebrates, which are neuroepithelial cells. These are the progenitors for, for uh, neurons. And these cells are, are, are proliferating cells, which have a, 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 an epithelial-like polarity. They, they are attached to the basal lamina on one side, and on the other side, they are attached to each other through, through addition complexes, and they have uh, specializations typical of, of most of, of, of epithelial cells, even a, an apical uh, primary cilium. And from these cells, you can get uh, 
many types of cells, including the projection neurons like retinal ganglion cells, and we are going to start talking about them shortly. And then also uh, photoreceptors as, that we, as we can see here are, are very different uh, to these other neurons in many, in many aspects. One thing is that they remain attached to the apical side of, 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 the, of the retina, in this case, when, when they differentiate but what, what was the former apical side of the neuroepithelium, and they remain attached to uh, other photoreceptors and to glial cells, which will be also originated from, from, from these neuroepithelial cells, which are Mueller glia, uh, through, apical, uh, com through sort of apical uh, addition complexes uh, based on NKDL. And from the part that is basal to, to that apical site, there you have the, the, the cell body, the nucleus, and also a short axon with a, with a, with a synaptic terminal. But then on the apical side, you will have a, a very specialized membrane, which will host uh, one very specialized cilium, which is the, the delta segment. And this is the, the photoreceptor area. Okay, so this is very different to this, which is a sort of classical neuron. So we are interested in understanding how uh, you get from this organization of an epithelial cell, which is the progenitor, to this very particularly strange form, let's say, or uh, polarity that neurons or photoreceptors have in, in the retina. So for this, uh, the main tool we use is, uh, is uh, confocal microscopy in vivo, and, and, and we make use of the zebrafish because of its uh, transparency, its optical properties, and also because it's very, very easy to do uh, genetic manipulation. So we, we, it's very accessible for that. So we can express uh, fluorescent proteins that can be uh, directed as we want to any part of, this, of, the, of the embryo or any part of the cells So uh, at, at any moment. So that's very convenient for, for labeling marking cells uh, in vivo. And this is the kind of uh, construct that we usually use based on a, on a promoter, which use, usually is uh, specific for some cell type. In this case, 807 is, will drive uh, expression mostly towards the, the retinal ganglion cell lineage. And then uh, a fluorescent protein that can be also modified, for example, with a, with a sequence that makes it uh, uh, a membrane associated. Uh, as membrane association is very important if you want to look at neurons because they, they have particularly a very profuse membrane. Uh, and so if you want to see the whole extension of the cell, it's better to, to use a, a membrane label. And uh, usually we use this, uh, this tall two uh, constructs that, that were mentioned earlier and uh, that allow us for, for insertion. So by using uh, correct uh, objectives in the confocal microscope by uh, stabilizing the embryo in, in agarose and, and under anesthetics, we can put it very close to the cover slip and then get images of these uh, transgenic embryos or transgenic or simply either, either stable transgenic or transient transgenic, just injected embryos with the construct, and then make uh, 3D volumes of, of the eye or part of the eye while the embryo is leaving and to see then taking images every few minutes we can reconstruct the behavior of the cells. And this, of course, we do it uh, together with, uh, with genetic manipulation, the manipulation of the expression of different genes that we are interested in. And I will tell you some, some of these stories now. Okay, so also as part of an introduction, part of what I um, all work showing an example of, of what, what the kind of things we, we do, usually we are interested in. So this is just uh, any, any epithelial cell, an epithelial cell model, where we see some of the proteins which are uh, part of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the important regulation process for, um, for, for uh, ipicobicell polarity in, in epithelia. So some of these proteins are uh, located mostly apical or just subapical, which are, for example, the CRB, PATJ, and pulse uh, complex. And then we have another complex, which also associated with this one, CDC42, PAR6, APKC, PAR3 as well, and sometimes associated to the tight junctions when, when there are tight junctions, which is not really the case of, for, the, for the new epithelium. And then you have uh, add uh, addition complexes uh, based mostly on encadering, which are associated to acting. And all these uh, complexes are interacting with each other, and this is very important for, for establishing epicobacial polarity in epithelia. This drawing is a bit exaggerated. Uh, all, all this is basically very close to the apical side, even if some of these molecules are found mostly on the lateral side, but just below in the subapical 
region. So one thing we can do is to use some of these proteins, for example, or for example, the psyllium, which is here also, uh, usually is apically localized in, in the epithelial cell, to la label polarity in, in, in the neuroepithelium. So for example, by expressing a PAR3 GFP construct, we can label the apical site, and we can see here, these are um, post-mitotic cells, post-mitotic neurons, which are still attached to the apical site. This one in particular here, you see the cell body, and this is a, a, an apical process on the, on the apical side of the, of, the, of the retina. And this is labeled by 807, so I, 85 is the, the old name of the, of the same promoter, the same gene, um, driving the expression of GAP RFP. So it's a, it's, a, it's a membrane form of RFP. And we can see in this movie how this is something we was quite surprising when, when we saw it the first time, how we, we get uh, the cell to, to retract its, uh, we see the cell retracting its apical process and growing an axon on the basal side, but at the same time, it's keeping on the tip of the apical process a bit of uh, part three that, that came as the cell retracted, as, as it, the cell detached from the, from the apical side. And then this part three will, will the accumulation will disappear and the cell will start to eventually to differentiate as a neuron. But, there is like, like a transition, like a, a gradual transition and, and an overlapping of, of events. Uh, something similar is seen here, but this in this case is labeling uh, the cilia, the primary cilia with a ARL 13B GFP. Uh, so we see the cilia here apically localized, and then we see the cell retracting and the cilium is, is remaining on the apical side, uh, always of the cell. Okay, when, when the cell is starting to differentiate, it's already, already formed the, the axon here on the basal side. So in this way, we, we have a, a working model related to, to neuronal differentiation in the retina, uh, particularly retinal ganglion cell, cells, uh, which is something like this, where we see how there is a, a gradual and uh, an overlapping transition of, uh, of events where you get an, from an epithelial cell to a neuron uh, while we, you are converting the cell in a way uh, into, into a neuron from an epithelial cell by uh, changing some properties and detaching the apical process, etc. So we, we are based essentially on, the, on, this, on this idea. And the cells will differentiate always close to the basal membrane and they will go far from the apical side, from the apical addition complexes. So one, this is also part of an old story, but uh, it is relevant for what I'm going to tell you immediately. Uh, one thing when we started to look at this, we, we wanted to know if, if uh, neuroepithelial polarity was actually uh, able to influence on, on neuronal differentiation, on different neuronal polarization. Uh, so we, we, there were already some mutants, and at that time there were no CRISPR or talents or anything when we started this. So we, we had to use either morpholinos or, or mutants that were existent. And there were mutants for two uh, very important proteins I already mentioned related to epical basal polarity, particularly PALS1 here and APKC here. So we took advantage of these uh, mutants, NOC, which is the uh, PALS1, I show you here, and HAS, um, which is uh, APKC. And we see here, uh, in, in, no, in the two cases, we get uh, retinas with uh, relatively sparse retinal pigmented epithelium on the surface. And also inside the retina, the neural retina, what we see is ectopic positioning of, of neurons as they differentiate. And uh, one interesting thing we found is that here you will see one retinal ganglion cell that will start to differentiate on the apical side of the, of the epithelium instead, instead of the normal basal side. And we will see how this neuron, instead of retracting an, an apical process, it will retract a basal process and it will grow an axon on the apical side of, of of the epithelium. So it is completely reversed in its uh, orientation, but still the cell is polarizing properly. And even this axon eventually is able to find its way towards the optic nerve and eventually to innerver innervate the optic tectum. So these cells are completely normal. Let's say only that they are mispositioned. However, in the Has mutant, uh, even if we have these ectopic neurons and we have some normal differentiation on the basal side, here we see some basal neurons, uh, retinal ganglion cells with their axons. Extend, extending towards the optic nerve exit, we see that ectopic neurons very seldomly form axons. Uh, that's, um, th that was quite puzzling, puzzling for us at, at the beginning, and we couldn't understand what, what was going on, why we got a, a nice phenotype here in the NOC mutant and not so much in the HAS. We thought, well, maybe this uh, mutation is milder or something, or, you know, the usual explanation. And then we looked at, at the 
again looked at the how, how the embryos looked externally. And something we can see here is a difference in the distribution of the RPE. We clearly see here there is less RPE and more spaces, and here less spaces and more RPE covering the eye. So we thought, okay, maybe it's related to that. And we looked at the electron microscope and also, also by confocal. And what we found is essentially that uh, in the case of the Haas mutants, the RPE is usually covering most, if not all, of, of the upper uh, of the apical side of, of the neural retina. While in the NOC mutant, we have accumulations of RPE cells leaving uh, big parts of naked uh, uh, neuroepithelium, which is the indirect contact with, as we see here, the basal lamina of the RPE, which is what we are labeling here with laminin, uh, with a laminin one antibody. So this is what's known as a Bruch membrane, and, and it's the, the basal lamina for, for the RPE, which remains, but then we see that the, 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 that the retinal pigmented epithelium cells retract into uh, accumulations and leaving some parts which are uh, uh, without, without cells. So here, the apical side of the epithelium is in direct contact with the basal lamina, which is not a normal situation. And indeed, by electron microscopy, we could find some axon, axons there on the apical side in this, in this electron microscopy. So we thought, okay, maybe some component of, of, uh, of the basal lamina is important for this reverse uh, orientation and this polarization of the neuron. Neurons, and maybe there's a positive signal for axonal growth there. Of course, one big candidate for that immediately was uh, laminin, because laminin is a very important component of that basal lamina, and it's known to promote axonal growth, particularly of retinal ganglions and many other neurons, but also of, of retinal ganglions. So we started to analyze this, and particularly this was the work of, of, a, of a doctoral student at Bill Harris's lab, where I was doing my postdoc at the time I, I did all these experiments. And uh, what he demonstrated is that indeed, uh, uh, laminin is important and essential for uh, for correct uh, axon extension in retinal ganglion cells. Uh, he found many funny things, like for example, that the cells take longer to form an axon, that they go through stages of, of mm, confusion, let's say, no polarization where they grow uh, in dendrites in all directions and then they grow the axon, and also that the axons uh, are extended from a distance, so the basal side is here, and the cells usually are kind of in the middle of the retina, and then they grow the axons from far. However, these cells still polarize properly, and they still eventually make an axon that will go to the proper in, in the proper direction. So there is a role, an important role for laminin, but uh, it doesn't seem to be the whole story. So we wonder, okay, laminin is important from the basal side to promote axon growth uh, of from, from retinal ganglions, which was not, not a big surprise, but it, ha it hadn't been really actually shown directly in, in, in the retina or retinal ganglions. And we wonder if there was anything else, maybe a negative signal that could be inside the retina uh, in the normal embryos, uh, uh, not allowing the axons to grow inside the retina, because this is something we never saw. So it's, uh, axons always grow here on the basal side or on the apical side, even in the mutant and the not mutant. It's very, very strange to see axons going inside the retina. It's not, it, sometimes it happens, but it usually doesn't happen. So we thought there might be some uh, negative signal. So what are ne negative signals for axon growth? Usually uh, they are, uh, for example, um, repulsive signals for uh, axon guidance. And many of them are known, like the slit proteins. So we, we first thought, because slits, we know they are, some of them are, are expressed in the, inside the retina, so we thought maybe they could be involved. In the cerebrofish, we have four slit proteins, six, four slit genes, uh, encoding four slit proteins, slit 1A, slit 1B, slit 2, and slit 3. And these are all very big proteins which are secreted, and they act on uh, specific receptors called robo-receptors, which basically signal towards the acting cytoskeleton uh, and then change the properties of, of uh, of the cytoskeleton and then change the, the, the direction in which uh, axons can grow. That's uh, and also they are involved also in cell migration. So we, we, we started to look at, at several of them and try to see initially by morpholinos if, if there was any phenotype. One funny thing we, we found, and I'm just going to show you, I'm not going to talk much about this, that's lit 1B, gave a nice phenotype, but not related to or, uh, cell orientation or polarization itself. So the cells are able to form an axon. But these retinal ganglion cells take a, a long, long time to retract the, the, the apical process. So they grow an axon, and then much, much later, many hours later, eventually they will retract 
the, the radical process. So this rating, of course, is very, very delayed in, in, in differentiation and development. So, and, and this later, uh, Grace Wong, again, uh, uh, Dr. Astrid, uh, Bill Harris's lab, uh, showed that uh, sleep one b is, through the ROBO3 receptor, is uh, inhibiting and cadering um, expression at the, at the, at the apical side, at the, at the membrane, uh, uh, of, of this uh, retinal ganglion cells, so uh, slit one b would be necessary for lowering encadering and encadering and then for the detachment of, of this, this neuron from the apical side. Uh, so this is not the role we were looking for. So we thought maybe okay, maybe there is another slit involved. So we switch to and this is a more recent work uh, by Camila Davison in the lab. Uh, she's a, a doctoral student here in Uruguay. And we started to look at SLEED2 as another possible candidate. SLEED2, we know uh, it's, uh, it's uh, important for axon guidance uh, in the in retina ganglioses in other species, and even it is expressed in the retina in, in mice, and, and, it, and there is a, even a, a, an inner retina uh, uh, axon guidance uh, phenotype in, 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 mouse, in the mouse mutants for SLEED2. Okay, so in the fish, we found that SLEED2 is expressed uh, in many regions of, of uh, this is, uh, these are embryos of 40 hours post fertilization. We see here, here is the retina, the eye, and then uh, here is part of the brain, the forebrain and the, and the diencephalon. And then we see here uh, the optic nerve. So we see a big expression in the optic nerve, also in the optic nerve head inside the retina, and also in some cells inside the retina that we, we uh, Characterized and we identified as, as amacrine cells. So it's a subset of amacrine cells. So this is a drawing to, to make it simpler. They are expressed here inside the retina, just apical to the to the retinal ganglion cells. So that was a very very interesting thing. And then also it's uh, distributed along the pathway of of the axons of the retinal axons outside the retina. So Camila made a mutant by now, yes, in the modern times by using CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, she directed. Uh, Directed a, a guide RNA towards the the very initial part of, of the of the coding sequence for SLE2 in, in, in the zebra fish, and eventually she got uh, in DELS and she got one uh, deletion, particularly of, of ten uh, nucleotides, which uh, would, according to what we saw in the sequence, it would produce a protein instead of the whole protein which has its uh, robo binding site here at, uh, close to the amino terminus would produce a, a very small um, largely nonsense sequence of, of polypeptidic sequence of 51 amino acids so this protein probably is, is eliminated so this would be a null mutant for for sleep 2 according to to this uh, calculation okay so does it have a phenotype in the retina this is the big question and does it have a phenotype at all well, first of all, <laughs> of course, it doesn't have any phenotype in the in the whole embryo. It doesn't have a phenotype in the adult. It, the adults are vi viable and they are able to reproduce, which is a good thing for us because we can easily produce metamozygotic mutants. We can get homozygous uh, adults and cross them and eventually get homozygous, 100% uh, of homozygous uh, embryos. And that's very handy for, for study, studying uh, some, uh, a gene that doesn't have a, a strong phenotype at least. We didn't see any clear phenotype in these mutants, in the, in the mutant line, in the retina, in, in none of the conditions, uh, either in the lamination of the retina or, or the formation of the, of the retina ganglion cell layer, the, the, ac the axons inside the retina. Well, I, will, I will not show you all, all the data here. There is some, some, some phenotype outside, but not inside the retina, really. Uh, I will show you some, some immediately of the outside uh, phenotype. Uh, but really, these are rather normal retinas and not normal embryos. Okay, this was not really completely bad news because we were not expecting SLE2 to act alone uh, in the retina. Right? Still, uh, it was interesting to study what happened in the optic pathway as, as uh, we, we saw this expression and we knew that, that SLE2 was known for, axon, for regulating axon guidance in the, in the optic pathway in other species. And also there is some evidence related to, to receptors and other things in the in the cerebral fish, so for example, the robot 2 receptor for which there is a mutant. So this is the, the optic chiasm, this is this is the optic nerve. And 
here the two optic nerves were labeled uh, anteriorly by, by Camilla by injecting the eye and the O in different eyes. So each eye uh, it was labeled with one color, and then each optic nerve was labeled with one color. And in this case, in the in the zebrafish, you have a complete crossover of of, of the of the of the axons. They they we, you don't have ipsilateral projections like you have in mammals. And it, actually, in the optic eyes, as we see here, they really uh, they really cross very segregated. So the two the two optic nerves are very separated, uh, touching each other, but not really mixing uh, at at the optic uh, chiasm level. And then you see the optic tracts that just continue towards the optic tectum. And this is the normal shape of the optic chiasm. What happens in these mutants? So here we start to see fa see funny things. And one thing is that in this case, one of the nerves has a hole, as you can see. And that hole is exactly at the position of the optic chiasm. And the hole is actually filled with the other optic nerve, which is crossing towards the, the, the contralateral uh, tectum. We don't see, again, uh, errors, big errors like, like ipsilateral projections or anything like this. Uh, there is a quantification. This, this phenotype is relatively penetrant. It's not 100% of the cases, but it's uh, up to 40%. We could, we could find it. Uh, and also seen in the in the morph in the morphans in the morpholino treated embryo. So we we will use quite a lot of also morpholino experiments here uh, to substitute for for the mutants in some cases. So this this phenotype is uh, relatively mild compared to to the phenotype you find in the in the Robo two mutant, which it has been known for a long time and it was produced at Chibin Chen's lab uh, a long time ago. Uh, and, and you see here a complete mess of uh, at the level of the optic chiasm with these axons. The Robo2 would be the suspected main uh, for, uh, receptor, sorry, uh, protein receptor for SD2. Uh, so maybe there is something else going on here. But still, we, we got this phenotype, so it was interesting for Camilla to, to try to understand what was going on there before going to see what happened in the retina. So other experiments she did, she injected, for example, uh, the I and the O in the temporal and nasal side of the of the retina to show uh, to to try to label uh, different axons in each nerve, and in this way uh, she could see things like this at earlier stages where we see uh, axons which are crossing here from one eye and from the other. This is injecting both eyes in the same way, so the both optic nerves have red and green uh, axons. And we see here where they are crossing. This is one nerve that will cross, should cross probably behind. This is anterior and this is posterior. So this is the one that crosses more posteriorly. And this is the one that will cross more anteriorly. And we see these ones are more or less crossing anteriorly without problem. But in this case, this axon from, from, this, uh, from this optic nerve is just going around the other way uh, to cross uh, anteriorly instead of posteriorly. So this is probably the way in which this is this is formed during development by axons making mistakes at the level of the optic chasm and one of the nerves surrounding the other the other, the other nerve. And this is a, a movie to show something like that. Um, I will show you immediately. This is a control. Um, this is with morpholino, so control morpholino embryo, and this is a, a slit two morpholino embryo. And we are seeing them now. This is the we are looking at them here and the. And, uh, well, the other image was rotating, but this, in this image we are seeing them from, from the ventral side, and now in this one we are seeing them frontally uh, to see how the axons cross at the level of the optic chiasm, and we see them at the same time, but you see here how neatly they converge towards the optic, to, to the mid lane, and they cross without any problem, while uh, you will see it again now as it repeats, and this, you see the mess here that is uh, obtained at the end uh, in the slit two morpholinos at the moment of the optic chiasm. Uh, we go around, and yes. And we see here how some axons make mistakes and they eventually go out from the, from, from the region where they should be crossing. And I'll probably like those mistakes that they make these axons to eventually cross wrongly and, and, and make a whole turn around the other optic nerve. And this is something we also see here. Okay, so what happens with the with the whole uh, pathway? So in this case, uh, what Camilla may did was to uh, did, do, do do the same injection, uh, die O in the nasal side of the retina, die I in the temporal side, and then in that way obtaining uh, in only one eye 
in this case the, in this case the right eye and so we are looking now at the embryo from the ventral side with the confocal and we see the whole pathway of one eye so the eye will be here it, it has been removed so to better see the, the, the optic nerve so the optic nerve starts here and here we have the optic tract and here in the, this dotted line shows the marks the, the position of the optic, optic chiasm so when we look at one only one nerve and uh, we see uh, the segregation of the two axons coming from the nasal and temporal side of the retina, we see that they remain separated all along the path, completely. All, all the time they are set very well separated, very well segregated. And this we see in, in transverse sections here, which are shown here, that they are always very well uh, separated. What happens in the mutant? In the mutant, so we see different things. At the beginning, if we make a section here at the, at the proximal optic nerve, what we see is a nice segregation. And we also see a segregation if we look at the distal part of, of, uh, of the optic path, so at, at the uh, distal uh, optic tract. But in the middle, from the distal optic nerve through the chiasm and at the proximal optic tract, what we see is essentially a mixture of axons. So axons are not segregated, not only between nerves, but also inside the nerve. So inside the nerve, there is a, a, a mess of axons crossing uh, or, or growing in different positions and not segregated as, as they should be. And these are essentially quantifications of that. So just is, uh, is uh, measurements of, of uh, signal intensity, fluorescent signal intensity uh, through the optic nerve. And we see here the clear segregation of the two signals in the, in the optic nerve and optic tract for the, for the wild type. And this is for one embryo, which is this one. And this is for several embryos put together here, normalized to, to show how they, they neatly separate in, in the case of, of, the, of the controls. However, in the, in the morphs, we see here that the, in the optic nerve, we, we see a segregation, but then in the, in the optic tract, particularly at, at the proximal optic tract, we see a mixture of axons uh, at different positions. Okay, so, so there is a problem, a serious problem with segregation inside the, the optic nerve. In this with this, uh, with this work, uh, Camila got this very nice uh, cover at the second issue of Cells and Development that just, just uh, last month. So these this, uh, results are all published there, so you can, you can check that. Okay, so what happens with the retina? You may be asking, this guy told me that he was going to talk about the retina. Okay, what happens in the retina? So what we see in the retina is, uh, okay, this is a wild type embryo. We will see movies just showing how neurons differentiate, something more or less I, I already show you. Uh, we see the, the retraction of the apical process of the cell and then growing of an axon. This is more or less the, the stereotypical behavior of these cells. What happens in the slit 2, in this case, the morphant, which is just almost exactly as the mutant, as I mentioned before, well, essentially the same. There is no clear phenotype. Nothing really big happens with these neurons. They retract the apical process, they grow the, the axon. Maybe they have some mistakes here in the while they grow the axons inside the retina, on, on the basal side of the retina, but they have no polarization problems. The laminin one uh, mutant in this case, I already showed you what happens. In this case, they, they grow uh, the axon from a distance, they take longer to grow an axon, but they still, they polarize properly and they orient, orient properly. What happens, you may wonder, when we mix the two of them? In lam uh, laminin um, background, we inject sleep to morpholino, and there we start to see cells which, which are able to grow axons in different directions. So they, they are now have seem to be have lost the, the sense of direction. They are not able to they grow an axon, they polarize growing only one axon or an axon like neurite, but they they don't really grow it necessarily towards the basal side. They may they may do it, it seems to be random. This is something that is work in progress, and and, and this is a bit preliminary. Uh, Results, uh, Camila is doing many different approaches to, to confirm this and to analyze, uh, which I'm not showing you, but, but this is just to give you a hint that now by, uh, this indicates that the two signals, uh, laminin on the basal side and slit two uh, inside the retina are uh, essential and necessary for properly orient, orienting the cells, at least regarding to the, to the, to the axonal growth. Well, okay, so this is uh, the first part uh, of the story I wanted to tell you, and I will dedicate the last uh, minutes to tell you about another story that has been going on in the lab more recently related to trying to understand how 
now we get a completely different type of neuron, which are photoreceptors from the same cell or initially from the same type of cell, which are neuroepithelial cells. So we're interested in the very early stages of uh, differentiation of, of uh, photoreceptors here. Okay, so uh, first of all, we, we, we made a characterization, and this is work by, uh, by Gonzalo Aparicio and Magela Rodao. This was also published uh, this year. Uh, and uh, one thing was to analyze the formation of, of the outer nuclear layer where, where these cells will be located. And we see that this, this, uh, this is not, this has been shown by others as well. This uh, layer is formed uh, gradually by cells that are starting to accommodate uh, apically and these cells are we know they are um, photoreceptors or at least they are committed to become photoreceptors because they express this gfp under the regulation of crx uh, promoter crx is a gene which is expressed in uh, particularly in photoreceptors also later in bipolar cells but in at earlier stages uh, stages and much stronger in uh, photoreceptors both kinds cones and, and and rods and we know that cones differentiate earlier and that the several fish retina is enriched in cones related to to rods it's more similar to the human retina in the aspect so we see here how this uh, layer is formed uh, gradually we also see something that is quite interesting that these cells which are already expressed in gfp and the crx and they are already in the position to become photoreceptors they are able to divide we see mitotic figures at many different stages here by confocal microscopy and also by uh, electron microscopy. So we see here mitotic cells even at 60 hours post fertilization. And some of these have already been shown uh, by other labs uh, more or less recently as well. So these cells are able to proliferate. So they are really not, um, photoreceptors are starting to differentiate while they are still progenitors. So they are still proliferating and they will have, we know now, two cell divisions, one just, uh, I will show you now a movie, uh, just as they, 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 uh, they form, they start to form or they, or, or they ingress to the, to the future optic, um, sorry, outer nuclear layer, and then another one like 12 hours later. And that's the last one and the one that makes the, the cells to allow, um, allow them to finally differentiate and to grow a, a, an outer segment. So we show you here a movie of how these uh, cells differentiate to form the outer nuclear layer. This is uh, a progenitor that is, uh, re has retracted an, a basal process, I will show you now. It translocates the nucleus apical and apically, and then it accommodates here along with other cells expressing CRX, this one is stronger, uh, to form this future outer nuclear layer. There are many things, interesting things in this movie, so sorry, I thought there was let me show it again. You see here the translocation. And another funny thing I will tell you immediately is these uh, processes we see here. So we see a big activity of, of, the, of the cortical activity of the cells. And this cell is dividing there in addition. You can see a cell division there, all, all things I mentioned. If we do some false color here, very early stages to really highlight the, the cells when they are a very, very low expression of CRX, we can see here a cell that this, this same cell I'm show, I showed you here is starting to express uh, CRX, a very, a very small amount, and then uh, it has a, a basal process which is still attached to the basal side of the retina. Then at some point, some hours later, the cell which still has this nucleus more or less basal will detach uh, violently, violently and suddenly detach its uh, basal process and will start its movement towards the apical side. And this is what we see here, uh, just in cellular color as well, but showing different uh, times every 10 minutes in this case uh, of, of the positions of the same cell uh, in time from the basal mouse position, which is more or less here. I think it is the same image. And then to, work, to, to the time when they are in, already inserted in the outer nuclear layer. So here again, we see a behavior which is comparable to that what we see in the, in the retinal ganglion cell cells only that inverse. So these cells retract a basal process and they move and they translocate APK. Well, I, I just mentioned this uh, funny behavior the cells have with this uh, cortical activity that was very, very, very remarkable. Actually, it was present in all cells we could 
really see individually or, or more or less individually. And so we, we wanted to characterize this further. And uh, this is an image from, of uh, like a focal image showing one of these photoreceptor progenitors at very early stage at 40 hours post fertilization. The cells start to express CRX at around 36. So our move is usually start at 36 hours post fertilization and then we end them up by around 48 or a bit more, 50 hours post fertilization. So this is at 40, and we see here, this is the apical side, and this, all these are processes that we see here. I will show you, this is a movie, uh, this will rotate. So this is the apical side, we are seeing it, seeing it from, the, from above now, from the surface, from the apical surface. And we see this is like a spider, right? Like with many long processes extending on the surface. So it's like on the apical surface of the retina. I will show you now that they really are on the apical surface and they are extending from this cell. We have called these processes tangential pro processes, uh, as you see them here together with, with uh, acting stain, just to, to show that this is the apical side. And they are very abundant. At 40, 40 hours, they are easy, easy, very, uh, relatively easy to spot because cells are still very sparse. We have very few cells expressing CRX. Later, like 48 hours, there are too many cells already differentiating, but we still see at the border that uh, cells are really, uh, most of them have this process. And so we could measure at different stages and they more or less have always the same length of around three microns, and but they can be in average, but they can be up to 10 microns. So they can be several cell diameters in, in length. Um, by electron microscopy, and that's a very, very nice image is made by, by Magela Rodao. And she uh, observed how these uh, processes are really, here's the RPE and here's the apical side of the, of the neural retina, 40 hours and at 48 hours. And we see here how in the subretinal space, which would be the ventricle uh, of, of, the, of the rest of the central nervous system, where we find these processes sometimes connected directly to these cells which are apically localized, so we can probably see, say they are uh, photoreceptors, particularly the 48 hours where we only uh, find photoreceptors like nuclei here. So the, we see, uh, in this case, we see a few of them. And in this case, we see a lot of them. We see many sections of, of uh, processes here, transgenital process, processes in the, in the subretinal um, space. And this is by, by scanning electron microsco microscopy. And this is some published data by, by Magela. Uh, we see this at, at 38 hours post fertilization and 48 hours. And we see here a more or less smooth surface. But if we enlarge, we see that these cells already have at the, at the anterior ventral part where we already have uh, some photoreceptors differentiating. We have some few, a few uh, tangential processes that go from one cell to the others and they go on top of the other cells and eventually they can contact a cell which is far, uh, not really in direct contact with the cell. At 48 hours, we can already see something here, like very hairy retina that we saw the first time. It was quite surprising. And we see that these cells are completely packed full with, with, with uh, tangential processes on the apical side. By now, we don't know what these tangential processes are. We know they are very dynamic. They, they extend or retract very quickly. Uh, we know more or less their length and their general characteristics, but still we, we don't know what, what they do. Okay, so this was kind of a marginal part of, of the work. And then another thing was interesting, particularly for Magela, which who, who just uh, finished her master uh, thesis recently on this subject, uh, was to understand if first, if there is a primary cilium in this uh, photoreceptor progenitors, an early primary cilium, and if this cilium has anything to do with, with, with neuronal differentiation. And this is kind of relevant because we know the cilium is also uh, what becomes eventually the the ex outer segment of the photoreceptor, a much later stages of differentiation. But we wanted to know if cilia, early cilia, could also have a, a function. And this we see a ventral part of, of a retina. We see here from a cell uh, a short cilium uh, sticking out. And this is a, um, an, a transgenital process here, and this is a cilium. So they are, they are there, apparently. And actually, by confocal microscopy, she could see that at different stages, there are particularly earlier stages, there are always very short, very small cilia that can be detected by this um, acety acety acetylated tubulin stain uh, in the CRX embryos. Uh, we see that in the apical side, always in the apical side of photoreceptors, we could find some cilia. The cilia were reduced in number as time um, 
went by and they were very, very few by 60 hours post-fertilization to start to appear again, and a lot of them by 72 hours post-fertilization. At this time, at 72 hours, is a time when the outer segments of the photoreceptors are starting to form. So we are seeing two kinds of cilia here. Cilias, cilia, cilia, sorry, that are uh, present very early, and then cilia that are ex present uh, when the, the photoreceptor is finally differentiating. So we were interested in this cilia, actually, this early cilia, which uh, also Mahela characterized here by electron microscopy. She could measure them, and we see that they are also shortening as time uh, continues, and they start to get longer by 72 hours before the formation of, of uh, the outer segment. So do these cilia have any function? One thing uh, we found, essentially, the, the eyes are quite normal in general. We see a, a cilia phenotype, and this is something that, that had already been analyzed by Paula Lepanto in the lab. She was looking at uh, retinal gangloses, and I will show you just one result immediately. Um, so this was not surprising. It was the phenotype we knew it was, and it's the typical cilia phenotype. This is by, by using a, a combination of morpholina to IFT, AT8, and Edipsa. And what we see here in the retinal progenitor, in the, in the photoreceptor of progenitors, this is again a movie, we see here the basic process, and we see how these uh, cells remain with a basal process for longer, a basal process that retracts eventually, but it will grow again for a long, long time. So uh, basal processes seem to be having problems to retract in these uh, cilia disrupted embryos. And we make quantifications of this, and indeed they have longer cilia for a long time, when they should be have, have completely retracted the, the, the sorry, sorry, cilia, no, uh, basal processes. So when they ha should have completely retracted the basal processes by, by, by 50 hours, 53 hours, they still have more or less the same length of processes uh, than at the beginning of the differentiation. And this is also quantified here uh, with a measure, a measure in time of several uh, basal processes. And this is not very different to what Paola found for retinal ganglion cells. So in this case, it's the other way around. The cells should translocate and retract their apical process from apical to basal. And this is how they do in the, in the, in the controls. But they had problems in many cases to uh, translocate basically, basally and to detach and to, and to so not, not so much detach, but to, to to retract the, basal, the apical process uh, in um, upon cilia dis disruption. And this is quantified here as well. And this is how the cells look like. So there seems to be a problem uh, when affecting cilia, cilia in uh, cell positioning inside the retina. OK, and finally, something that we wanted to look at, and this is just to finish, was if uh, any of the polari classical polarity proteins were somehow involved also in, in in the differentiation of, of uh, photoreceptors, which was expected as, as they are, as, as I said, they remain attached at the apical site. So, uh, and this is Gonzalo work. He, he decided to, there are two, two strategies here. One is to use morpholinos and the other one is to do um, direct uh, mutations of the genes, of two genes of interest, which are encadenin and pulse one um, by CRISPR, but in this case, just to look at the, uh, at the injected embryos, so they are CRISPR embryos by injecting four uh, guide RNAs and the, and the protein for, and, and the Cas9 protein. And in this case, in this way, she, he could make different mutations and he could get very nice uh, phenocopies of the mutants for NOC and for CDH2, which were already, well, no CDH2 is encadering. And basically, in this in these uh, embryos, what we know it happens is that the neurons are, uh, appear ectopically localized inside the retina, and this was also reproduced by the morpholino. So I'm going to show you some results now uh, with the morpholino, which is the, the published results. Uh, one interesting thing that happens is that these photoreceptors still um, appear; they still differentiate in a way. But instead of doing it on the apical side, forming the outer nuclear layer, they form these rosettes, dispersed along the retina. And um, just by looking at them closely, looking at, uh, at uh, polarity markers, etc., which I'm showing here, we could see that these uh, cells actually polarize in these rosettes in, in, in an apparently normal way. So these rosettes are similar, in a way, to the outer nuclear layer, only that in small pieces, you can say. It's like small pieces of, of outer nuclear layer inside the retina. 
when we looked at the dynamics of these cells, uh, one thing we found is that they also have uh, processes, but in this case, they are not tangential processes. They are not apical because these cells are inside the retina. So they are external processes in no directions in 3D. Uh, so it's inside the retina. This is the, there is usually the, the anterior part where differentiation starts is the most affected in this embryo. And then this affection is extended towards the dorsal and, 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 tem and temporal uh, part of the, of the retina as, as differentiation progresses. And here, looking at these uh, two areas, this one cell we found here in, in the middle of the retina, having this behavior, and this by concentrate and, and here concentrating on this area, we can see this movie where we see a few cells, which are eventually uh, they are dispersed, but eventually they are joining to form one set here, here in the middle of the retina. And we see cells also that are dividing, and they are also extending processes in a very similar way to what we saw in the outer nuclear layer. Uh, and the process length is more or less the same as the tangential processes. So we, we believe these are actually the same as tangential processes, only that uh, in a disturbed uh, position. And this is quantified, and we, we can see here the movement of the cells in 3D. They move a lot. They really move a lot to eventually find the place which will be here in, at the middle, the, the, where they will position to form the rosette. So we could quantitate many things here. The distance migrated. They had to migrate, really, and um, the timing and the speed and everything. And what we found, of course, is that the translocation time to eventually form the rosette was much longer. But of course, the migrated distance was much, was much longer in these cells uh, than the distance were really made or the distance that normal cells had to migrate. But uh, a, sur a surprise in a way was that the speed of the cells was more or less the same. So cell behavior doesn't seem to be really affected. What is affected is the uh, organization of the neuroepithelium and <coughs> also the possibility of these cells to eventually uh, form a complete and, and, and a, a continuous optic, uh, uh, sorry, outer nuclear layer. Uh, and instead of that, they, they, they need to form uh, these, these rosettes. So encadenin at least doesn't seem to be important for the polarization of the cells or for the general behavior or differentiation, but only for the formation of the outer nuclear layer. So this is kind of the model just to finish. Uh, these cells uh, differentiate, uh, as I said, in a way the, that retinal ganglion cells do, only that in, in the opposite direction. One important difference they have is that they start to differentiate as they are still proliferating, and they usually have two cell divisions before uh, differentiating co completely. And they do these different divisions while they are already positioned at the outer nuclear layer. And while they are here, they extend these uh, tangential processes. They have a primary cilium at earlier stages, and then they eventually start to lose it. And um, here, the role of encadidium would be to keep the cells at the apical side and not allow them to go inside the retina, where they would take longer eventually to attach to each other and differentiate. So, and this is just to finish, uh, I just wanted to show you a completely different thing. Uh, remind you of the existence of LASEN. This is very important, particularly for, for people doing zebrafish work in Latin America. Unfortunately, our last meeting had to be uh, cancelled. We can we like to say still postponed, but now it's been really cancelled. Um, that was going to be in, in Cusco, in Peru. Uh, but we, we have the, 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 the tradition of making uh, meetings every two years. So the, the, the network has already 11, is it 11, already 11 years old, and every two years we have been making um, meetings and courses. And these are images from courses, one in Porto Alegre in 2016, and one in Cuernavaca in 18, in, in Mexico. So just to finish, uh, I want to thank you, and I want to thank the lab, and these are highlighted here, the guys from whom I, I showed uh, some part of, of their work in, in this presentation. Hope I wasn't too long. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Flavio, for this amazing talk and amazing pictures. You can see the excitement of this work. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, before we start making the questions, I would like to remind the audience that the the link for the certificates will be ready only after our next our last talk of 
of the day from Hita Fuel. So only at the, day, the end of the day, you will have it available. So Professor Zalesi, we have a question, two questions actually from Saeed Shafi Sabet uh, related to color detection. And he said, great and interesting presentation. Thank you. When, at what age, zebrafish larvae can perceive and detect colors? Ah, uh, color, okay. Uh, uh, that's a very interesting question. I, they start to see, for sure, um, more or less at five days post-fertilization, when they stop being an embryo and they become a larvae, and they have uh, already um, free life, and they, they, can, they can swim and eventually have to catch prey. So they need to see for that. Uh, for catching the prey, um, for sure, they they have their cones working by then. I am not completely sure uh, about the development of color vision because that would involve more things like you know interpreting the color. But for sure, they have the cones uh, from very early stages. As cones are, are the are the main cells in this in this retina from early stages, and they they, they remain like that in the adulthood. They are. Uh, daytime um, living living uh, fish so so they they have a cone enriched uh, retina i would say from early stage but i'm not completely sure maybe should, we should ask someone or we can check that but, uh, i i will guess at very early like five days thank you and he continued to ask uh, are there any different color detection abilities in larvae zebrafish and adult zebrafish it seems zebrafish have different color preferences in larvae and other right. stages. Right, that's a good question. I don't know exactly the, the answer to that question either, but it might be. I mean, it wouldn't be surprising actually. But not sure if it is uh, because of perception itself or preference for some other reasons, like behavioral things related to you know hiding uh, from pre possible predators, but uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, not, not to be able to, to answer that question properly. Okay, no problem. And Isabella from Inesti, she's asking, can sensory clues like different preferences for colors or visual clues from predators used as environment enrichment influence, whoops, environment influence during the early stages of axonal development? Uh, no, I don't think so. They, 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 we are not expecting them to see so early as when the when the axons are being formed initially, at least. Of course, uh, one thing we have to have in mind is that the the fish they, they will grow the retina as many other organs all along their lives, and actually the retina uh, continues to grow and they will have stem cells forever in the embryo. In the in, sorry, the fish even in the adult, and they will continue growing as the fish grows. The retina, the eye, and everything will continue growing and this that's uh, that's uh, made by by adding new cells essentially so there will be axonal growth and everything even in the adult however at the stages i was looking at a very early uh, we were looking at at the very early stages here uh, the retina is not uh, still ready for for vision and so there is no vision not not from the retina at least of course there, there are some they are capable of detecting light by other ways of, of, of photoreception, but not really uh, at, the, at the level of the retina yet. Okay. Not sight, really. Thank you. Another question from uh, Ananta Krishna Tantri. Uh, she said, wonderful presentation. I have a doubt. What was the visual activities lead to no mutants? Did That's an excellent question. <laughs> on their peripheral vision? Well, we, 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 we want to test that. We haven't tested that yet, but we want to test it to see if, if there are any, any defects in, in many things. Could be, you know, visual acuity, of course, color detection or things that we, we could eventually find. Um, we, we are planning to test that. We, we haven't done it yet. Uh, so, but yes, it's, a, it's an excellent question. That's a, an open question because also we have the embryos and the, the fish which grow uh, up to late stages. So it would be nice to see how they see. Yeah, great. It's also a doubt I, I also had because if this misposition uh, of the optic nerve could lead to a kind of blindness or something. No, they are not blind for sure. 
No. So they are not, they they can see they they, beha they their behavior is completely normal. So you cannot really distinguish them unless probably you you do you know very delicate measurements like they, they we were shown yes uh, uh, earlier today. Um, but when you look at the, at the fish, the other fish they behave completely normally. So and they, they of course they see they they see without problem. So you you can you can realize that uh, just by approaching them and. You know, making the 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 mimic of, of giving them food, they see you, so <laughs> they, they come to you immediately. So it's just like normal fish; they have no no problems in seeing. Uh, that doesn't mean they see properly, perfectly, but they see. The vision is is intact. Maybe they need glasses or something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Maybe. Sorry. Maybe. Um, Isabella uh, Gemondi is asking: Can sensory? Oops, I already asked this one. Uh, Hong Young Chen is asking, uh, he's from National University of Singapore, that technically oh, yes. that CAAX and GAP43 have the same efficiency in labeling the membranes for the processes to be seen, which one is the better? So the short question is yes, uh, essentially we didn't find, we didn't see any real differences. Um, we just switched because eventually we had constructs that have had one or the other. So the initial, the older constructs we had, they had a gap 43, and then we got other ones which had the CAX um, portion, and, and they seem to work very similarly. So at least for our purposes, so we, we didn't find any 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 problem with any of them. Go go ahead with any of them, and unless are you and I don't know. Of course, if, if you want something very specific, then maybe you have to test that. But we didn't find any, any important difference. Okay, thank you very much for this presentation. Then we finish our questions sections. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you for listening. The next. Lazen will be in Cusco. I don't know if you have any idea. Well, let's hope it will be first. <laughs> and then, uh, yes, uh, hopefully we can still do it in Peru. And if, if we can't, of course, we, we will have Lazen for sure, uh, even if not uh, in presence, at least uh, at a distance. Let's see Let's see what, what how things develop in the future. Let's be hopeful that everything will eventually get more or less normal. And, and yes, we can have Lazen again. <laughs> Yes, hopefully. To, to meet to meet all and to travel and everything. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to remember to remind the audience that we are coming back at, at 10 to 1 uh, time from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And now we are going to have the videos of the institutional videos and the and from the sponsors. Thank you very much. See you soon. Saúde. Direito de todos e dever do Estado. Direito à moradia, ao emprego, à educação, a um meio ambiente saudável, à água potável, ao lazer, à cultura. Direito à voz e à paz. Respeito à diversidade. Saúde para a Fundação Oswaldo Cruz abriga todas essas dimensões. É assim desde 1900. Uma visão integrada da saúde. Na pesquisa, ensino, assistência, informação, comunicação, memória. Na promoção da saúde, na inovação onde permanentemente se pensam respostas para as necessidades da sociedade, onde se faz ciência em defesa da vida. Você pode até não saber, mas carrega a Fiocruz dentro de você. Desenvolvemos e fabricamos vacinas, medicamentos, biofármacos, testes para diagnóstico. Formamos pessoas do nível médio à pós-graduação. Realizamos pesquisas para superar ameaças à saúde para diminuir riscos ambientais, para prevenir doenças e agravos, pesquisas que beneficiam crianças, adultos, idosos. 
uma instituição pública e estratégica de Estado, integrante do Sistema Único de Saúde, com uma rica história de contribuições à sociedade. Presente de ponta a ponta no Brasil, onde cada trabalhador é um elo forte e ativo. Nela, ciência e saúde cumprem uma função social para o país e o mundo. Pés fincados na tradição. Olhos voltados para o futuro. Somos patrimônio da ciência e da saúde, da humanidade, do povo brasileiro. O Instituto Nacional de Controle de Qualidade em Saúde, INCQS, foi criado em 1981. É uma unidade técnico-científica da Fiocruz que atua em áreas de ensino, pesquisa e desenvolvimento de tecnologias de laboratório relativas ao controle da qualidade de insumos, produtos, ambientes e serviços. Parte integrante do SUS é elemento do Sistema Nacional de Vigilância Sanitária, atuando em estreita relação com a Agência Nacional do Setor, a Anvisa, laboratórios de saúde pública, vigilâncias sanitárias estaduais e municipais, entre outros entes. O INCQS é o único que realiza ensaios em lotes de sangue e hemoderivados utilizados no Brasil e é a instituição responsável pela análise laboratorial para a liberação de lotes de vacinas e de soros hiperimunes produzidos ou consumidos no país ou para exportação. O Instituto também avalia reagentes para diagnósticos, conjuntos, artigos e insumos para a saúde e para diálise, medicamentos, cosméticos, saneantes e alimentos, por exemplo, detecção de níveis de agrotóxicos de drogas veterinárias e de transgênicos e analisa amostras relacionadas à saúde ambiental. Além da atividade laboratorial, o Instituto emite pareceres sobre questões técnico-científicas relativas à vigilância sanitária. O INCQS é acreditado pelo Inmetro em diversos ensaios laboratoriais e serviços de calibração, tendo um sistema de gestão da qualidade consolidado e eficiente. Inclusive, é pré-qualificado pela Organização Mundial de Saúde nas áreas de medicamentos e vacinas. Este é o Instituto Nacional de Controle de Qualidade em Saúde, na Fiocruz, contribuindo para fortalecer o SUS em benefício da população brasileira. O Instituto de Ciências Biomédicas da Universidade de São Paulo é uma referência nacional e internacional de qualidade no ensino, na pesquisa e nas atividades de cultura e extensão. Fundado em 1969, o ICB está localizado na cidade universitária em São Paulo, com instalações em oito prédios. Possui ainda uma unidade na cidade de Montenegro, em Rondônia, e um posto avançado em Cruzeiro do Sul, no Acre. O ICB está estruturado em sete departamentos, anatomia, biologia celular e do desenvolvimento, farmacologia, fisiologia e biofísica, imunologia, microbiologia e parasitologia, os quais contemplam as principais áreas das ciências biomédicas. Nosso ambiente é multicultural e amplamente democrático. Aqui no ICB valorizamos a conduta ética, respeitamos a diversidade, incentivamos a consciência crítica e capacidade criativa dos nossos alunos, funcionários e professores. Em meio a esse universo multidisciplinar, o ICB completa seus 50 anos com uma excelência consolidada e busca formar cada vez mais profissionais que produzam conhecimento e inovação de modo a contribuir para o desenvolvimento da nossa sociedade. Seja você também parte do nosso Instituto. Somos o Instituto de Biociências de Botucatu. Somos 950 alunos de graduação 
400 estudantes de pós-graduação, 150 técnicos administrativos e 130 docentes. Juntos somos uma grande aglomeração. Aglomeração de trabalho, de pesquisa, de ensino, uma gigantesca aglomeração de conhecimento. E este ano nosso IBB faz mais um aniversário. Já são 57 anos de história. Mas esse aniversário é sem dúvidas, não da forma como eu e você imaginávamos. Pois eu te pergunto, onde está todo mundo? Em meio a essa pandemia, fomos todos surpreendidos e de uma hora para outra transportados aqui para esse mundo virtual. Um mundo que a gente conhecia apenas como entretenimento, mas não era um mundo real para as nossas aulas, as nossas pesquisas e atividades de extensão. Até porque estávamos acostumados a conviver fisicamente, com os corredores, os departamentos, os laboratórios, sempre cheios. E aí, fomos todos virtualizados e nada mais era como a gente conhecia. Dá a impressão que perdemos a nossa identidade. Mas, na verdade, nós fomos desafiados. E, embora tenha sido muito difícil no começo, percebemos que temos uma capacidade de mudar, pois criamos novas conexões e novas maneiras de nos comunicar. Aprendemos a aprender e vimos que somos resilientes. Cada um com o seu conhecimento, com sua dedicação, não mediu esforços para num trabalho único reconstruir o IBB que permanecesse além da sua estrutura física. Nós nos reinventamos. E nesse aniversário tão diferente eu sei onde está todo mundo. Talvez nunca estivemos tão próximos e com a certeza de que não importa qualquer outro desafio que nos espere, nós estaremos sempre aqui no IBB. Parabéns a todos nós! Nos dedicamos a ensinar, a inovar e a transformar por meio da ciência e da atuação social responsável. Essa é a missão, há 45 anos, da Unesp, a Universidade Estadual Paulista. Uma jovem instituição, com 34 unidades em 24 cidades do estado de São Paulo, 22 delas no interior, uma na capital e outra no litoral, em São Vicente. Essa ampla presença garante ensino de qualidade para mais de 50 mil alunos da graduação à pós-graduação. Estamos entre as universidades que mais produzem ciência no Brasil, e temos orgulho de dialogar com as comunidades e compartilhar o resultado do nosso trabalho. Falar da Unesp é falar de todos e todas que ajudaram a tecer essa história em prol de um ensino público, inclusivo e de excelência. Trabalhamos diariamente para criar soluções e equipamentos para a comunidade científica, contribuindo com o avanço da pesquisa biomédica latino-americana. Nossa missão é maior do que somente fornecer equipamentos. É proporcionar segurança com atendimento de qualidade e, principalmente, com muito respeito e atenção. Por isso, investimos em alta tecnologia e buscamos manter relacionamentos duradouros. Nosso compromisso é ser um parceiro confiável, que compreenda as necessidades, a realidade e as condições de cada cliente para, assim, oferecer a melhor solução sempre. Entendemos os benefícios da pesquisa científica para a humanidade e isso nos estimula. Se hoje temos melhor qualidade de vida, maior longevidade, se vencemos um câncer ou fazemos uso de um remédio para dor de cabeça, é porque o avanço da pesquisa biomédica nos permite. Confiamos no trabalho dos pesquisadores, na ciência e na comunidade científica. E nos orgulhamos em fazer a nossa parte. Assim como você, somos apaixonados. Ciência é o que nos move, porque para Alesco, pesquisa é para a vida.